Thank you. Okay, can folks hear me? Okay, welcome. Wow, this has a wonderfully festive air about it already. My name is Michael Waterstone. I have the honor of being the dean at our law school. Um, so I get to be the first of many people to welcome you to our annual Critical Race Symposium, which this year celebrates the remarkable career of our colleague, Professor Laura Gomez. Before I continue, I want to acknowledge the native people on whose land UCLA sits. As a land-grant institution, UCLA and the law school acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We pay our respects to our ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging. Um, so I'm going to be relatively brief, because at this point I'm realizing I'm the only thing standing between you and hearing from Cheryl Harris and all of these incredible folks on the podium. Uh, but, and, and I'm relatively new here, um, so I've not had the opportunity to work as closely with Laura or for as long as I would like. Um, but it, it, it's clear to me that I think life is about moments, and this is one. And Laura, I hope you're able to take it all in and process and enjoy. I know that you have family and loved ones here, so thank you for allowing us to honor you. And, and while I don't know you as well as I would like, um, I'm pretty good at seeing impact, and I see your impact everywhere here. And that is just a joyous, wonderful thing that will truly outlive all of us. And, and not many people achieve that. So today is really a celebration of that. So uh, you don't need me to tell you why words like energetic and thoughtful are fitting words as we reflect on Laura's tremendous work and impact on our institution on the course of critical race studies here at UCLA Law and throughout academia and much more. Laura is quite simply a force. And when you ask people to describe Laura, you hear words like brilliant, warm, collegial, innovative, dedicated. These are all the words that like, we all want people to describe us as, but, but very few do. Um, and, and soon we're going to have to add something else to that label, which is someone who we'll really, really miss. But certainly a retirement is an appropriate moment to take stock of things in CRS, at UCLA, and beyond. And I know that our panels today will lead to the type of valuable insights that have marked Laura's entire career. So it's obviously impossible to summarize everything that Laura has accomplished. And I know that many other folks here know her far better than I do and will speak about her as a collaborator and a colleague. But I get to go first, so I'm certainly going to offer a few highlights. Along, alongside four other members of our faculty, Laura co-founded the CRS program here at UCLA Law in 2000. And she has served more than once as its faculty director, steering it through nearly a quarter century of influence and excellence. Now, when we look backward, it's kind of easy to take that for granted, but I really want to pause and savor and appreciate how extraordinary and important this is. Before 2000, no law school had a CRS program. And to this day, UCLA Law stands alone, but stands strong in hosting this center of thought leadership and scholarship in critical race studies. And, and this has been a really key and important and difficult period particularly over the last four years, as the country's undergone a national reckoning over systemic racism, particularly following the killing of George Floyd and so many others. And critical race theory is coming and is under attack in schools and state houses across the country. With wisdom and calm and confidence, our faculty members, including Laura, who was the program's faculty director, I'm told, at the start, so under this extraordinary moment of stress, has firmly defended their scholarship and the immense value of the work that they and so many others do to make our society more equitable. But of course, that's not all. Laura originally joined the UCLA Law faculty in 1994 
And her record of service includes terms as vice dean of UCLA law. So thank you for that. That's a special form of service. Uh, and the interim dean of social studies in UCLA college, which clearly you're just a glutton for punishment. Um, she also served for several years as an associate dean and professor at the University of New Mexico School of Law. She's spoken widely, taught legions, many of whom are here today, and, uh, publi and published extensively, notably her 2007 book, which I know we're going to discuss today, Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, and her more recent book, Inventing Latinos, A New Story of American Racism, which came out and won awards and acclaim in 2020. So I could go on and on, um, but it's time for me to stop. Uh, but let me just say, Laura, thank you. Thank you for being such an amazing colleague and teacher and mentor and someone who truly built the fabric of this institution. Uh, I also want to thank everyone that worked incredibly hard to put today together, certainly including our sponsors, the CRS program, the Latinx Law Students Association, and the Chicanx Latinx Law Review. So thank all of you. So now I get to turn things over to Cheryl Harris, who certainly needs no introduction. Um, you all know her. But another true titan in the field, she is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Professor in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, and our Vice Dean for Community Equality of, and Justice, and of course, Laura's longtime colleague and friend. So Cheryl, turning it over to you. Thank you all, and thanks to the organizers for putting this event together. Uh, it's not only fitting, but necessary that we gather and recognize Laura's contributions and her critical role in our community as friend, as colleague, and as scholar. Uh, it's important, of course, in order that her work and her role be acknowledged and affirmed to her, and that she be given her roses today. Um, there's a lot I could say about Laura as a friend, and if I can get this mic to stop moving, I'll say it. Okay, let's see. Uh, there's so much I could say about Laura as a friend, and stories I could tell about the more than 25 years that we've known each other. Um, the things that we have seen and heard in this building, my dear, alone. But I'll, I'll save them for a moment, uh, hopefully when accompanied by an adult beverage and the appropriate company, we can go over all of that. Uh, but that's more than this time that I have here will allow because there's a lot to say and a lot of people that want to have things to say. But fundamentally, I guess what I want to say is what I've come to know of Laura as a friend uh, it carries over to who she is as a colleague and a scholar. And I just want to identify some of the themes that for me tie together the person, the colleague, and the intellectual. Uh, first of all, Laura is fearless. Um, this is true whether she's fighting over her own ideas or views or fighting on behalf of somebody else. However difficult or challenging, she will not turn away or duck or run or look for cover. There's nobody more committed than she once she's engaged and no one better to stay the course, no one better to have your back. And this is true regardless of the context. Uh, where others might make calculations about whether to stand, Laura stands tall at least in the metaphorical sense. Um, Laura is meticulous. Um, I've often marveled at how she plans and organizes and moves through the mountains of uh, information and distractions that too often derail those who are organizationally challenged like myself. Um, she's quick and she's really allergic to procrastination. So you have to keep up. Uh, and this is probably one of the reasons why although I am her senior, she is ahead of me in getting to retirement. <laughs> um, Laura is also a true critical thinker. She is not satisfied with platitudes or surface encounters. She digs deep. She seeks the truth and strives for honesty in her engagements, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's impolitic. But it's always real, and it's always driven by care. Laura is empathetic. We all, I think, aspire to be empathetic human beings. So many of life's challenges come upon us unexpectedly. But often in the press of events and circumstances, and I'm speaking for myself, our lives interrupt or confound my intentions to reach out to somebody that I know that is struggling, to tell them that I'm thinking of them and that I care, 
but Laura never forgets. Um, there's a call, there's a text, there's an email, there's a note, there's a reminder that we are not alone in our struggles. And that, too, is an invaluable trait. So all of these attributes show up in Laura as a friend and as a colleague. Um, but in the time I have remaining, I actually want to spend some time with her work. Um, because I don't know that I've ever had enough time in public forums to talk about how much her work has meant to me. So over the course of several major monographs and series of articles, Laura has made intellectual contributions across multiple disciplines and domains, from history, law and society, critical race theory, sociology, in ways that are not only unique, but that stake out ground that reorients how people think about things going forward. Beginning with Misconceiving Mothers, which was a book that built on her original research for her doctoral thesis, Laura took up the question of how, when, and to what extent why the criminal law was turned against certain mothers who were believed to be using certain drugs. Dorothy Roberts' groundbreaking work had previously identified the selective prosecution and use of criminal sanctions to punish black mothers as an instance of regulating reproduction through race. But Laura's contribution was to explore how this occurred, when it occurred, where, and why these tools were used, and how they changed over time. It was a classic law and society inquiry into how law operated on the ground, but it also offered an important case study on how race operated and was constructed in and through the context of public policy and state power. So, so, so often our legal scholarship focuses on cases. The genius of this book was to actually look at, at law as policy. Law is the question of claims making. How did the politics of law end up shaping what the law is? Misconceiving mothers illuminated how the social and legal context for the push to punish the mothers of so-called crack babies was more than a site of moral panic. It was a site of political struggle. And whether a criminalization model or medical treatment model was adopted depended upon and was tied up with competition for political influence in jurisdictions that were undergoing demographic and political change. Combining her skills as a sociologist with legal analysis, she gathered information from the ground up from key players in the system to map more precisely how the system worked, how it adjusted and accommodated the interest of multiple stakeholders in a broader political struggle. Her next major, bo major body of work changed sites significantly. It moved from the late 20th century California to 19th century New Mexico, a very different site, but deploying the same formidable interdisciplinary focus to examine the origins of the contestation over Mexican-American identity. In a series of articles and ultimately a book uh, which has become legendary, and rightly so, uh, she articulated an analysis of race, racialization, and the position of Latinos, more specifically Mexican-Americans, that arguably reset the terms of the debate. In focusing on New Mexico and specifically the history of this former Spanish colony, Laura was able to bring an illuminating approach to the debate over Mexican-Americans as either an ethnic or racial uh, category that was grounded not in sort of speculation but in the historical archive of the local criminal law. The book challenged prevailing notions of, Mexi of New Mexico's exceptionalism, that is, that the history of New Mexico as a majority non-white state was outside of the national model of white over black racial domination, that because of the participation of Mexican Americans in the public process in the state, it was different, and that there was less racial oppression. Her book put a lie to all of those myths, and most crucially, while many scholars focused on immigration as the crucible through which Mexican Americans and Latinx people more broadly were racialized, before the term settler colonialism actually came into the common context, Laura was bringing it to bear on the frame, the, bringing to bear the framework of colonization to unpack both the specific case of New Mexico and its implication for the complex development of racisms under white supremacy. This was not a story of immigration, she said, but one of conquest and violence, and understanding how New Mexico was a location of double colonization, that of Spanish colonization of Mexico and U.S. colonization of those same lands in the wake of the Spanish-American War, it provided insight not only into how New Mexico was subdued and conquered, but how the racial paradigm of white dominance accommodated, adjusted, and was reconstituted through the construction of Mexicans as a racial category. So the racialization of Mer Mexican Americans she repositioned was not a margin case to then be subsumed within the prevailing paradigm. As such, the role of law was significant where the criminal legal system and ideologies of race coalesced in ideas of manifest destiny that constituted Mexicans as a racial category 
albeit one that was ambiguously coded, at times officially white, while most of the times relegated to an inferior state. The role of law in constructing this dichotomy, the legal construction of white while socially constructed as non-white and racially inferior, she persuasively argues in the book can be found not again sort of in pulling the theory from the sky, but in looking at actually what was happening on the ground. Um, the co-evolution, um, I'm sorry, in New Mexico then, Mexican Americans were situated as a wedge group between Euro-Americans and Pueblo Indians. And ultimately, this ambiguous whiteness helped solidify a divide between Mexican Americans that ultimately undermined even the elite Mexican-American power that had been attempted to be exercised in the state. More importantly, it also had implications not just for New Mexico, but for our national understanding of history and race. The Civil War period then was not just a story about the fight to end the enslaved and the black people. It was also a period in which the struggles against colonization and the ascendancy of manifest destiny and the American colonization of northern Mexico. And so she describes in really brilliant terms, and I really encourage you to read this, she interweaves the story of what happens with Dred Scott, what happens with the Civil War, into the story about what is happening to Mexican Americans in New Mexico. That was actually a mind-blowing, I think, contribution, one which we are still all reckoning with, uh, and one for which I, I thank her and try to teach it as best I can. Um, her most recent book, Inventing Latinos, I, I'm sorry, one other thing I wanted to make. The implications for this sort of interweaving are really profound because it helps us understand that the structure of racial hierarchy in which blacks are a permanent underclass allows for other groups to aspire to whiteness through behavioral and ideological loyalty, but that always that is incomplete. That is always an incomplete project. And hers was one of the first major accounts of how white supremacy actually operates through multiple technologies of race, sometimes even definitions of race that seem to be contradictory, but what they are ultimately serving. Her most recent book, Inventing Latinos, is no less groundbreaking than the first, and it takes up the debate again now in the 20th century, 21st century, where once again she takes up the shape-shifting nature of white supremacy, the different ways that racism operates differently but still protect whites, and writing against the conventional wisdom of Lat Latin Latinos as an ethnicity, not a race. I'll have to stop here because I can keep going on, but I just want to say that part of what is, I think, so absolutely marvelous about the work uh, and why we are gathered here today is to give her her due. And I would argue that it is important for us as a reminder both of her contribution and of the central nature that her valuing our collective project has made. Our collective project of critical race studies would not have happened without Laura, would not have happened without her sacrifices, without her time. And it's come to be that in this project, we have all benefited from each other's labor, concern, ideas. We are each other's harvest. And it is in that spirit that I want to mark what Laura has brought to us today. Dean Professor Harris, wow. Um, hi everyone, my name is Uriel Saldivar Esteban and I'm a 2L here at the law school. Um, I'm on the board of the Latinx Law Student Association and um, our members and the boards um, sends their best regards to the professor, in particular our co-chair uh, Jackie Diaz who isn't here to join us, but it's my immense pleasure to be here today to highlight um, the amazing profe uh, Laura Gomez. Um, as the Dean and Professor Harris so eloquently stated, Professor Gomez's contributions to the law school and the legal field are profound and numerous. But I want to elevate her impacts on her students and express our deep gratitude for her years of dedication, intentionality, and compassion. Um, I had the honor of taking criminal law with her last semester. Uh, and needless to say, it was remarkable. I didn't particularly uh, want to take criminal law because I am not particularly interested in um, 
being involved in uh, criminal litigation, but Professor Gomez made the class an absolute joy and so memorable. Um, I even remember the first day of class uh, when she came up to me and stroke up a conversation over my shirt. I was wearing a sh shirt about the Mexican national soccer team. It had um, depictions uh, and homages to the indigenous roots of the country with Aztec art. Um, fortunately, they never wore it at the World Cup because they got knocked out of the group status, but <laughs> neither here nor there. Uh, we connected over our Latinidad and it, it, just the warmth and accessibility of the professor just really made me feel welcomed and belonging in the room. And I thought to myself, I was taken aback, like, wow, like, I had this great conversation. I didn't even have to come up with like a finely tuned legal question about a case or <laughs> something. And honestly, that was uh, fantastic and a great sign of things to come. Um, Professor Gomez constantly went out of her way to push student, students to think beyond uh, the case law and to really grapple with the larger um, consequences uh, in society uh, with criminal justice and policy um, and with a particular sensitivity towards racial issues. Um, she created a safe space to really uh, be conducive to those discussions, and I really re relished those uh, sessions and office hours. Um, but as I got to know her more throughout the semester, I also got to witness her dedication to her students outside of the class. Uh, Professor Gomez has been an invaluable advisor to the Latinx community here on campus, and in particular for Olsa. Uh, for example, during my time on the board, she encouraged us to be vocal with the administration about different ways that they could better serve our community. Uh, with her guidance, several members of OLSA uh, had the opportunity to discuss with um, Dean Waterstone to begin uh, for, uh, forging a relationship and furthering those goals. Um, we supported the candidacy of a prospective Latinx faculty member to help equity efforts on that front. Um, on a side note, I uh, also really appreciated the inclusion on that process and would love to follow up and reconnect with the dean and the administration to uh, <laughs> see what is being done to sustain efforts on that front um, to maintain the, the efforts and roles that Professor Gomez has so di uh, diligently fulfilled. These are immense shoes to fill and they can never be replaced, but we, it is imperative that we add an, a, another Latinx faculty to join the ranks at UCLA to carry the baton forward. Now, Professor Gomez has encouraged her students to take a seat at the table because she has reiterated that we belong at the law school, that we belong in the legal field, and that we should lean into these tough conversations. And she's broken barriers uh, for others and has made the legal profession better for it. Um, Professor Gomez's profound impact on her students has spanned multiple decades, since 1994, and honestly, a very specific instance that a uh, highlight of that for me was earlier this year at the Latina Law Symposium uh, here on campus. Um, I and other students were there uh, graciously as Professor Gomez helped uh, provide tickets for students to attend that otherwise might not have had the capacity to. Um, but I was, on a, I was sitting on a panel uh, about workers' rights and um, there was uh, Lorena Gonzalez on the panel. She's the current head of the California Labor Federation and actually uh, an alum from uh, UCLA Law. Um, but what really stood out to me while they were discussing uh, the, the workers' movement and inc inciting wisdom was that how unprovoked, um, without even uh, Professor Gomez being in the room, uh, Lorena Gonzalez was highlighting and crediting the impact of Professor Gomez on her legal and professional careers 25 years after the fact. Um, and honestly, I can only smile and clap in agreement because um, that's how I feel. Uh, I've seen it. I, I've. Um, and that I can attest to that being the professor's track record and legacy. Um, in fact, by the time our criminal law class ended last semester, it was a seamless flow to get students to voluntarily uh, contribute and collect funds. Um, and we busted a mission to the Flower District. We got a beautiful bouquet as a small token of appreciation on the last day of class uh, for the professor because um, such an amazing professor needed a proper send off on her last day of class for her last class at UCLA. And that is what today is all about. Professor, giving you your flowers and recognition because you deserve that and more. As a first generation Latino, I am thankful for having been part of Professor Gomez's tenure at UCLA Law. UCLA is undoubtedly losing a force as uh, Dean Waterstone mentioned, but I am truly thankful for having crossed paths 
uh, with you, Profe Gomez. Um, I wish you nothing but the, ne but the best in your next chapter, and from the bottom of my heart, gracias por todo. So can we please give a round of applause for a true champion of education, diversity, and social justice, Profe Laura Gomez. First panel, maybe you can take your seats. Hi, uh, my name is Jerry Kong. I am a distinguished professor of law, and I am here to moderate uh, the first panel, Teaching and Learning from Manifest Destinies, the Making of the Mexican American Race. Uh, as a handout, not a handout, but as an aid, I actually have a copy of the book, second edition, uh, which is 2018. Um, and uh, you've already heard extraordinary. Um, analysis uh, from uh, Cheryl Harris about the importance of the book and, and the whole point of this panel is to actually break it down and its significance. So I will not belabor the point. I, I just want to say something about the book and I actually want to say more about Lara, um, but I'll have to keep it appropriate. So, okay, so the book. Uh, the, the book's an extraordinary force. Uh, it, it, in some ways, uh, takes really seriously uh, what it means to understand law and race to be mutually uh, constitutive and to actually highlight the different place that Mexican Americans, Latinos, Latinas, Chicanos, Chicanas, play in the racial hierarchy that is America, to struggle hard with the reality that we are a multiracial democracy, to be in California, to think about what it means to have that identity and how it came to be. Uh, she writes an extraordinary text that combines law, sociology, history in the interdisciplinary way that you would expect of Laura Gomez. There's lots of things that we can talk about in the book. I'm sure they'll be unpacked. War and colonialism, uh, a term that I've always uh, remembered, the idea of being off-white. I'm not talking about linens. I I'm talking about race. What does it mean to be off-white? And also this idea of being fearless, intellectually, emotionally, politically. Uh, she's unflinching, uh, and I think that is extraordinary. And even in the intellectual content of the book, she shows that char character. Uh, she talks about what Mexican-American elites uh, had to deal with and what they chose to do as they, for example, distanced themselves from other non-whites, whether they be Pueblo Indians, slavery. Um, she's unflinching in asking the awkward, hard questions. And even as we posture uh, to be uh, you know, politically correct, although these days it's politically correct to be politically incorrect, but as we all posture in our own ways to represent and to signify how much we get it, it also matters a great deal to actually ask the hardest of questions, to be unflinching, to be truly critical, which oftentimes requires us to be self-critical. Uh, that's the kind of intellectual vibe that I've always admired of uh, Laura, but that's enough about the book. Uh, more about Laura, all, all that I'll say is that we've known each other like forever, for most of our law school careers, and then I picked up the book because she, she gave me a copy, it was free. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, she wrote something nice on that, and, and it, it says, for Jerry, what a ride it's been. Uh, I feel like we've grown up together. Uh, and it's actually mm -hmm. true. You started, what, in 94 here, technically here, I think? 93, sorry. Like, I give her credit. Um, uh, I started just a couple years uh, later, and we, we have been on a weird journey together in unexpected ways. Uh, and there's some things uh, that we both, uh, you know, in some ways uh, align very uh, strongly on. Like, I, I admire Laura in part because she is unflinching, and I try to be as well. I admire her because she resists procrastination. I also try that as well. She plays a strong, mean, administrative game, and I try to do as well. Like, I want to be like Laura when I grow up. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. In, in any event, um, in order to discuss the book, we have an extraordinary panel. 
Uh, I uh, dislike reading long bios. They're all in the, uh, in the back. Let me introduce each of our speakers uh, at the beginning, and then they'll each take a turn talking about 12 minutes. First, uh, going from your left uh, to uh, right, will be uh, Jenna Carpio, who is an associate professor of the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicano Chicana Studies and Central American Studies here at UCLA. Uh, she knows this book well. She teaches out of it. Many of her students will buy it, so that's all valuable. Number two, we have Nicholas uh, Espiritu, who is is the Deputy Legal Director of the National Immigration Law Center, a graduate of the Law School of the Critical Race Studies uh, Program. Like back in the day, like 2004, you're dating yourself. Um, um, and, uh, and we look forward to his comments. And finally, we will have Cassandra Salgado, who is a a graduate of UCLA, a PhD uh, in sociology in 2019, an assistant professor in sociology at Arizona State University. Uh, and we're going to just take turns, 12 minutes each. Uh, some students are going to be very strict in policing the time, uh, so will I. And then we're going to have some conversation. I'll probably ask uh, annoyingly difficult questions and then probably get people in the audience to participate as well. Um, it's going to be an extraordinary day. It already has been, uh, but the intellectual fireworks are about to start. So, Jenna, can I ask you to start? Sure. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I also want to be Laura when I grow up, <laughs> so we share that in common. So I first met Professor Gomez in my first year at UCLA. I was very fortunate. I was paired with her in her service as a mentor with the UCLA Council of Advisors. This is a group of experienced faculty members who have volunteered to provide career advising to junior scholars on the, on the tenure track. Um, as you have already sensed from the people in the room, I really kind of won the lottery of mentorship in that pairing. In that role, Dr. Gomez advised me on life at UCLA in Los Angeles advice on building my tenure portfolio and how to connect with editors. She also offered invaluable advice on navigating life as a professor and mother. And today's a special day for me because I was able to meet her mother today as well. And I can see where she gets it from. <laughs> I have valued and cherished our coffee meetings and lunches and the one-on-one -on -one face time with my extraordinary colleague and friend. But we've also been involved in another form of exchange. We read each other's work. Indeed, my own book is indebted to hers for its important contributions in comparative race studies, colonization, and interdisciplinary approaches to research. I'm sure this is a debt shared by many of us in the room. At the time I first read Dr. Gomez's book, Manifest Destiny, I was in graduate school, working towards my PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity at the other school in LA whose name I will not name. <laughs> As I was preparing for my qualifying exam in Chicano and Latino history, Manifest Destiny served as my entry into the diverse race-making processes of the Southwest. It opened my eyes to a world beyond California, where I grew up and which had shaped my ways of understanding how race is made. By placing New Mexico and its ties to a larger national and hemispheric context at the center of Mexican-American history. Her book gave me new insights into how race is made and experienced in relationship to Anglo-Americans, African-Americans, and Native people. Indeed, one of the most important lessons from Manifest Destinies is how it reveals the diverse workings of comparative racialization. This approach maintains that we better understand the racialization of Mexican-Americans when viewed alongside other racial projects, to cite Omeo Anant, on whom she draws, that are simultaneously shaping other groups. That is, Manifest Destinies demonstrates that Mexican racialization cannot be understood fully apart from New Mexico's indigenous and African descent populations. One example of this approach is her attentiveness to relations between Mexican and Pueblo populations and the divide and conquer strategies of American settlers. Through legal history and sociological methods, she shows how the conferral of white status and its benefits to Mexican men, yes, men, such as the vote, and the denial of such privileges to Pueblo people, helped maintain settler rule by undercutting Mexican Pueblo coalitions that might have challenged American occupation 
as it had in other instances of collaboration. More so, she demonstrates that these very categories of race are intimately intertwined with one another. Consider the story of Esteban, a man perceived as white by the Pueblo people, as black by Spaniards, and whose racial background continues to be debated today. Dr. Gomez is a leader among those who created the pathway for what is now often called relational race making or relational racializations. That is, where the study of race has often been framed as one non-white group in relation to a white center. She has been a key figure building the foundation for an understanding of racialization that recognizes it as a dynamic and interactive process that occurs in relation to whiteness, as well as in relation to other subordinated groups. A second significant contribution to Manifest Destinies has been Gomez's conceptualization of what she calls double colonization. The term Manifest Destinies might first conjure Frederick Jackson Turner and movement of American settlers westwards upon native lands. I myself often think of the painting American Progress. Shaped by her attention to the dynamics of the American Southwest, in this context, double colonization is instead a recognition that American colonization of the region was grafted onto the Spanish colonization of previous centuries. That both systems impose a system of status and equality grounded in racial difference. And that the various racial groups who comprise the Southwest were forced to navigate two racial regimes simultaneously. To understand the significance of this conceptualization, it's important to understand that much of Chicano history at this point in time had been framed around the Mexican-American War. That is, Mexican-American history had been marked as starting at the war's conclusion with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. The treaty conferred citizenship rights for Mexicans living in the conquered territories of the United States by granting them white status. Rather than starting Mexican-American history at the signing of the treaty, however, Manifest Destinies instead recognizes the Southwest as subject to two different colonial regimes that each shaped Mexican racialization. In this conceptualization, the hierarchical Spanish uh, caste system, Spanish importation of enslaved Africans, and a firm line conceived between Spaniards and native peoples did not fully disappear, but rather intersected with an emergent Anglo-American racial order in the mid 19th century. Her book centers the tensions that arose as the Southwest moved from one racial regime to the other, often violent encounters that have been erased by regional myths of tricultural harmony. More so, it shows the key role of multiple colonizations in that process. Now as a teacher, I have the privilege of introducing Manifest Destinies, which is now in its reprinting, a huge accomplishment for any author, to my own students. And we're excited to hear from other folks in the room who use the book in this way. And I feel pretty special knowing Dr. Harris teaches it too, and we have this thing in common, like, amazing. <laughs> Should be friends. <laughs> um, I am excited because I get to watch uh, as I learn from her masterful analysis across themes, including Spanish conquest, colonialism, and racial transitions. And as they experience this core part of Mexican American history for the first time. Manifest Destinies is considered so significant in the field of Chicano studies that it's required reading for all of our graduate students as they prepare for their subject exams, as it was for me, and likely a notable share of PhDs in the room. It's just that foundational, or to quote Dr. Harris, legendary. But I'd like to end with a note about undergraduates. I often teach our introductory course in Chicana, Chicano, and Central American Studies. This class lays the historical basis for our major. Manifest Destinies serves as the basis for that class, which draws upward of 800 students a quarter, many in their first year and many first-generation students. Since the first time I taught the course about eight years ago, I've seen students enthusiastically engage concepts in the book, like collective amnesia, Mexicans as off-white, and of course, double colonization. They've also been strongly drawn to ideas that they've pulled from the text, 
such as, quote, the lure of whiteness, or the ways in which elite Mexicans attempted to claim the privileges of whiteness, often at the expense of other communities of color and indigenous populations. As a course taught in the fall with a high enrollment of first years, this is often the first book our undergraduates will read as college students, and it sticks with them. Take one student who described the ways Manifest Destinies helped them better understand how, quote, both Spanish and American colonization promoted an ideological racial hierarchy with white supremacy on top, again, a first year, <laughs> and another who described the ways U.S. settlers attempted to maintain political, social, and economic hierarchies by disrupting potential alliances between Mexican Americans and Pueblo people. And still another who described, quote, the importance of studying history through an interdisciplinary lens, all lessons they gleaned from the text. In one of my very first class sessions, we were privileged to be visited by Professor Gomez. Students listened attentively, asked thoughtful questions, and stayed after class to greet her. They were drawn to her scholarship, but also her openness and the way she related to their experience as college students. One story that stands out to me to this day was an experience she described eating tamales out of a can when she was a college student. Still have trouble like wrapping my mind around that. <laughs> Her mother's here. I don't know. Well, I know. You know, because it's hard to find homemade stuff in Cambridge, right, in the 80s. <laughs> Although many of our students are local and have no trouble finding corn masa with delicious fillings, they can relate to that feeling of being out of place and making the best of the resources they do have. In sharing her fish out of water story, they felt a little less alone in their new pond. More so, having met an esteemed law professor and author, students could envision a place for themselves in the university, interdisciplinary scholarship, and law through her aspirational model. Manifest Destinies is path-making scholarship, and it makes books and careers like mine possible. But it does more than that. It creates pathways towards relational work that is attentive to differentials and power across marginalized groups. It combats historical amnesia and reveals the roots of always changing but resilient racial regimes that build on one another. And it helps scholars and students see their world with refined vision so that they can better take charge of their own destinies. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try to navigate this uh, this tech here. I have two things to click. I mess up, please bear with me. I'm really honored to be here today to recognize the work and career of Laura Gomez. And much like Professor Harris, I I'd like to see if I can engage with her work a little bit to see if it can help us understand the current political moment. And going back through Manifest Destinies, there's at least two claims in there that I'd like to engage with. The first, which I feel is maybe even now canonical, is that law has been central to the project of racialization, particularly Latino racialization. The second, which is a predictive claim that at least I saw in the, in the uh, reprinted version in the epilogue, which is that Latinos are moving not towards whiteness, but away from it. Just yesterday, the New York Times ran an article to talk about the growing Latino support for Donald Trump. This is a theme that's been prevalent in the media since at least 2020, and one that can be seen in light of potential support for a man who began his presidential campaign vilifying Mexicans as possibly an echo of those claims to return to whiteness. 
this seems to cut against the narrative that I think that Laura would um, would have articulated manifest destinies. Um, but I hope that <laughs> borrowing uh, borrowing a little bit of her methodology, history, law, and social science, as well as my own experience as a civil rights litigator, that I can help contextualize some of these reports, but also our recent history with regards to anti-immigrant and anti-Latino laws. So to this end, let's move slightly west of New Mexico to Arizona and a little fast forward into history. So what we have here in the slide is a little snippet of what the 2000s looked like in the state of Arizona. Here, there's a host of laws. Uh, the elimination of English language learner uh, programs, attempts to ban Mexican-American studies, a pattern and practice of racially profiling Latinos by the largest sheriff's office in the state. Not to mention a host of anti-immigrant bills, including the notorious SB 1070 passed in 2010. SB 1070 was the product of, in large part, the intellectual product of the man at the, I guess that's the top left, you guys, um, Chris Kobach, who, uh, who passed around model legislation for several states uh, to encourage them to engage in a pattern of legislating in ways that would affect the immigrant community. Um, we might hear, see some echoes of that in some of the anti-CRT and other legislation that we um, hear today, as well as um, it might be a playbook for what we see in terms of uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Latino, and, um, and other conservative agendas. And around the, the panel, we see other actors. Tom Horn, uh, the, the AG at the time, Governor Jan Brewer, uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, the individual who was found to have engaged in this pattern and practice of targeting Latinos. The architect, the, the legislative architect of SB 1070, um, Russell Pierce, um, one of his compatriots, John Kavanaugh, uh, and finally, um, uh, Mr. Barnett there, who was convicted uh, or was found liable for, um, for vigilante action against um, Mexican immigrants on the border. But turning back to SB 1070, it's a little in the, back in history now, but here are some of the main provisions of that law. Uh, most notoriously, the show me your papers provision, section 2B, but there was also several other provisions which targeted uh, individuals for their immigration status, as well as targeted individuals who perceived to be Latino or perceived to be immigrants, such as day laborers um, with section 5. The one thing that this bill had uh, was that there are no provisions which are facially, um, which on their face discriminate on the basis of race. They're all targeting some other kind of status. However, that was definitely not the rhetoric that was being used at that time to support SB 1070. It was well understood um, by the population, both for and against, that this was to combat a Hispanic invasion of the state. Um, we all know, or at least many of the lawyers in the room know, that a lot of the rhetoric about colorblindness has been like, legislators rarely say if they have prejudicial motives. That really wasn't the case for a lot of the legislative record for SB 1070. <laughs> um, it's in small print, um, at least for me over here, so I can't read it, but maybe you guys can. Um, these are snippets from uh, emails, um, other other information that we got from discovery in the course of litigation um, that dealt with the kind of blatant anti-Latino um, animus that was animating um, SB 1070. These are emails from legislators to other legislators conflating race and immigration status. Um, there was additional, here's additional racialized language during the SB 1070 debate itself. And finally, um, numerous discriminatory statements on behalf of constituents to legislators showing their support for SB 1070. So 
kind of front to back, this was understood to be an issue that dealt not just with immigration, but also with individuals' racialized status. And in this way, we're seeing some strange echoes of what uh, Professor Gomez was talking about in her book. We have a nominally race-neutral regime, but a racialized um, conception of who's being targeted. We have laws which intentionally discriminate against immigrants on its face, and which are permissible in many instances under current um, US law, but also which, um, which are targeted to affect the Latino community. So as litigators, what is it that we do? So we understand this racial context, and we know that there are some legal tools, as weak as they are, for us to go after such facially race-neutral rules. So um, there's tests that we can use, using some of the materials that I've highlighted here to attempt to demonstrate the intent to discriminate. That wasn't the only tool in our arsenal at this point. And as good litigators and as people who represent clients, we have to use the tools which we think can be effective to bring relief to our clients. And there was a second tool that we had there, which was under the supremacy clause. Much of the anti-immigrant laws that have been passed in recent years have been challenged on the basis that they, they are preempted by federal law, that they intrude on the federal government's either exclusive power to regulate immigration or some part of the immigration re regime. So really, the two claims that we had are one, is this racial discrimination and can we prove it? Or two, <laughs> who has the power to discriminate in this particular instance? And we had to mobilize both in our case, and we brought them on behalf of a cross-racial alliance um, of individuals um, who were very insistent that we foreground race as one of our claims. However, um, after we filed our lawsuit, the federal government came in and also filed another lawsuit. So the Obama administration challenged Arizona's SB 1070, not in its entirety, and not on the basis that it violated the Equal Protection Clause or was racial discrimination, only on this latter claim that intruded on their power to regulate immigration. So it was essentially a question of, of, of they were only asking the second question. So here, um, the picture isn't actually from the SB 1070 debate, but I thought it was kind of fitting. That's Governor Jan Brewer pointing her finger in uh, President Obama's face. So. At the preliminary injunction hearing in Arizona, there was huge crowds outside. People understood. You could see that the public understood this as a racialized dynamic. Inside, the only arguments that were argued that particular day were about preemption, were about the federal government's power, in part because it was the nature of the, the early claim, but also because it was understood that this might be the, the, the thing that we had the evidence at this particular time. And we won in large part. Um, or I should say the federal government won in large part because they, the preliminary injunction was only issued in their case. So as it moved up through the Supreme Court, what we got was the federal government being the sole person to argue um, about whether uh, SB 1070 was constitutional or not. So just a little picture of the oral argument. Um, you're about to hear John Roberts questioning uh, Don Varelli, who was the Solicitor General of the United States and um, challenging the law. Let's see here. No, here we go. Thank you, Mr. Clement. General Bruni. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Um, so before you get into what the case is about, I'd like to clear up at the outset what it's not about. No part of your argument has to do with racial or ethnic profiling, does it? We saw none of that in your brief. That's correct. Okay, so this is this is not a case about ethnic profiling. We're not. That's it. That's all the discussion of racial profiling that had occurred in the Supreme Court. And while we were successful for most of the the uh, for for most of the claims in the case, um, we were not successful ultimately at the lower courts to be able to sustain our equal protection claim, in part because the lower court judge, when it came back down to her, essentially felt that we were precluded from bringing those claims as a facial matter. So there is nothing, there is no ruling today from a court in SB 1070 that marks 
the racism that occurred that recognizes it in law or that understands that that was part of the dynamic in that decade. Out of the list of cases I sent you, there is only one where there's a finding of racial discrimination. All the rest, despite the record, despite what we understood, are, are, have been adjudicated on other grounds. I think I, I'm running out of time, but I want to close with a little bit about what I think this means um, going forward. And one, it is not the sole province of the law to define race and racialization. The courts would have you believe that Arizona was free of racial discrimination. There are none of these findings, but that is not the understanding of advocates on the ground. These are individuals who have their own, who have developed their own meaning and understanding and responses to the attacks on the Latino community in the wake of SB 1070. And what we've seen is the development of a rich um, and varied body of civil society that looks to empower the Latino community in the state of Arizona. I think this points a, a, a real counter narrative to what um, we're seeing in the mainstream media about the polling data um, and the like. I'm happy to provide additional information in, in Q&A, um, but maybe I'll leave it with this, which is um, one of the plaintiffs in one of our other cases who has started an organization who has looked to raise the voices of the Latino community, of the immigrant community, um, Reina Montoya, and who has done things like been able to pass legislation that has overturned some of the anti-immigrant um, bills of the 2000 um, to 2010 and has instituted the ability um, for undocumented students to be able to get in-state tuition in Arizona. And so I think what we're seeing is instead a trajectory that recognizes a real sense of group identity and group um, political empowerment. <laughs> Hello, hello. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here today to take pause and celebrate Lara Gomez's work uh, during her tenure at UCLA. In my talk, I'm going, to, I'm going to discuss Laura as a mentor, her influence on the field of sociology, and her influence on my work. I first met Laura when I was a graduate student in sociology at UCLA. I knew that I wanted to do something on Mexican Americans, identity, and race. But when I started graduate school, three books came out on this same subject, looking at the experiences of Mexican Americans in California. My advisor, Vilma Ortiz, suggested that I talk to Laura, given her book on Mexican Americans and the judicial, sy and the judicial system in New Mexico. I remember my first meeting with Laura. I was intimidated by her, but I also admired her. She was a faculty member in a law school, a place where we don't see many Latinas. In our first meeting, she asked me if I had ever been to New Mexico, and I was like, no. <laughs> Did I know anyone from New Mexico? And I said, not really. She asked, why do you want to do research in New Mexico? And I said, because there was a research gap, question mark. My answers to these questions did not point to a promising intellectual future. <laughs> I gave her no information to work with. Looking back, she definitely chose me based on promise. <laughs> and this is really important because a lot of advisors cherry pick students to mentor. And for many people who are navigating academia for the first time, it takes time to get adjusted to the different cultural expectations of higher education. And that takes cultivation, not cherry picking. As I prepared to move to Albuquerque to collect interviews for my dissertation, Laura allowed me to practice my interview questionnaire with her. In my questionnaire, I asked about her academic trajectory. And I was really impressed that she went to Harvard for undergrad and received her JD and PhD from Stanford. I asked her, how did you get into these Ivy League private schools? And I vaguely remember her saying that she was exceptional. <laughs> yeah. Um, the sentiment that I remember was that she was intellectually gifted. That was the takeaway message. And I was initially taken back by that. Um, but later, I understood the importance of taking ownership of your work and scholarship. 
especially in academic spaces where women and scholars of color are often infantilized. Laura has taught me to own my smarts, and that ownership isn't necessarily boasting, but acknowledging that I deserve and have earned my place in academia. Moving forward to Laura's scholarly contributions. Manifest Destinies examines Mexican-American strategies of staking claims to New Mexico territory at the time of American statehood so that they could be incorporated into the U.S. with citizenship and political rights, which were only reserved for whites at the time. To this end, Mexican-Americans in New Mexico claim Spanishness as a form of Europeanness to access whiteness on paper, even if they were treated as non-white in their everyday lives. Now, my work builds on Manifest Destinies. In 2015, I conducted 96 interviews with Mexican Americans, popularly known as Hispanics, residing in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In my book, I explore the extent to which New Mexico Hispanics still identify as white on the US Census or as Spanish in their everyday lives. I also explore how these identity narratives shape whether they see themselves as part of the larger Mexican origin population and whether they see themselves as members of a racialized group. Manifest Destinies has several contributions to understanding how race operates for Latinos and American society at large. The two main ideas that I return to, especially as I think about my own work, are double colonization and how race operates differently depending on context. Double colonization refers to the fact that the American Southwest was subject to two different colonial regimes. The first was Spanish colonization of Mexico in the 16th and 17th centuries, and the second was American colonization of Northern Mexico in the 19th century. As Lauda shows, thinking with double colonization helps us understand how whiteness was valued by both Spanish and American empires, although in different ways. And together, these colonial dynamics set the foundation for Latinos' distinct claims to whiteness and racialized identities. In the book, Laura brilliantly connects Mexican Americans' history of claiming whiteness to patterns of identification among Latinos in the US Census where Latinos largely straddle between marking white or some other race. Laura argues that marking white on the census is feasible for present-day Latinos as it signals their desire to be accepted as citizens on the part of the American government in the same way as whites, a strategy that dates back to their whiteness claims to access citizenship at the time of New Mexico statehood and strategies of upward mobility in order to claim whiteness under the Spanish empire. And when I think with double colonization in my own research, I think about how colonial mythologies about Spanish identity among New Mexico Hispanics and perceptions of racial harmony among Hispanic, Anglo, and indigenous peoples in New Mexico have not been completely supplanted, but can appear to varying degrees within contemporary discourse. This is important to acknowledging that American conceptions of race, often rooted in a white over black racial order, cannot neatly explain how Latinos think about race. The second lesson from Manifest Destinies that I continue to return to is that the US has a history of multiple racial categories and multiple racial orders at play depending on context. In the book, Lauda links American colonialism in New Mexico with slavery and Jim Crow in the American South to show that granting people, that granting Mexican people citizenship that is whiteness on paper helped to perpetuate the subordination of black people. On the ground, this encouraged many Mexican people to distance themselves from black people, but also indigenous Chinese and Japanese peoples depending on context. Beyond complicating our understanding of white over black subordination, Manifest Destinies demonstrates how divide and conquer strategies help strengthen white supremacy in the US and created challenges for mobilizing across racial backgrounds. Now I teach classes in sociology on race and ethnicity at Arizona State University. And when I teach about early formations of race, Studies tend to focus on East Coast narratives about race. And Manifest Destinies 
fills a critical void in helping me talk about Mexican and indigenous peoples in the Southwest, especially in terms of the fact that I teach in Arizona. There is a sense from a historical perspective that the American government had different conquering strategies for different groups, for example, slavery for black people, assimilation programs for indigenous peoples. But in thinking with the case of Mexican Americans, students begin to learn that the conquering strategies of non-white peoples were diverse and contradictory, like giving Mexican Americans access to citizenship and subsequently whiteness. And this is important for students to understand because it expands their ideas of how race operates in the US, especially in thinking about how the elevation of one racial group can help subordinate other racial groups, but that this strategy is, is, that this strategy is still in service of white supremacy. And when I think about how New Mexico race relations adds to our understanding of white over black subordination, I think about New Mexico's status as a longtime Hispanic majority state. California became a Hispanic majority state in 2021 and Texas in 2023. My work shows that New Mexico Hispanics still face racism despite their longtime membership in American society, belonging to the dem demographic majority and degree of political representation. In short, New Mexico Hispanics have not assimilated into whiteness. As we think of majority minority demographic change in this country, I argue that belonging to the majority group may have little to do with who holds power. Instead, we should focus on the explicit and implicit ways in which white supremacy is reproduced in institutions and structures. In closing, Good sociology speaks to academic audiences and people's everyday experiences. There is no doubt that Laura Gomez has accomplished this in Manifest Destinies, which will continue to make an impact. I am grateful that Laura has shared her exceptional intellectual gifts with us. Thank you for your time. Um, so, uh, Excellent concepts, uh, interesting topics, uh, all put on the table. Let, let's have uh, some conversation, and then we'll get, uh, if people want uh, to ask questions from the audience, we'll get that in play as well. Uh, maybe let's uh, talk a little bit about comparative racialization, uh, uh, which is in some ways the topic that uh, was just mentioned. Here's my question. I want to know how this book helps us understand the nature of comparative racialization in modern day America right now. So like we, we heard themes about this, right? Whether Latinos are going left or right uh, in a particular election. Um, but just think about the complexity uh, that uh, this term Latinos actually includes. Think about you know Venezuelans, Cubans, uh, Chicanos, uh, El Salvadorans. Um, and I wanna suggest that there is always a psychological tendency to liken yourself to those who have more, to power, to beauty, to influence, to wealth, to want to fit in. It's just a normal thing. You're just going through high school, you want to be part of the cool crowd. Uh, and that's what people want to do. Racialized groups, like all groups, want to do that as well. If that's a tendency, and we see it everywhere, not only with, again, what's been explicated here or with the experience of Latinos, but think about Asian Americans, think about ethnic disidentification within each of the groups when, again, you know, the Japanese, after they came, said they weren't the Chinese uh, as we came, as again, different waves of immigration came to the United States. So it's just a thing that psychologically provides in some ways self-interested advantage. We've seen it over and over. Um, what does understanding this book allow you to do as a scholar and advocate uh, when you run into this phenomenon. That's what I'm trying to f figure out, very concretely, brass tacks kind of way. If you see this drift amongst your friends, relatives, students, it's in some ways, I want to suggest, quite natural. How do you actually ask them to pause and reflect on the basis of what you learn from this book? Any takers? Let's go now. <laughs> I will start. I will say that I, I in large part agree okay. um, that it's natural, but it's also 
when you're in the context of seeing that you know there might be some in group but you are excluded from it there is there is a process of saying well maybe that's not the group that I should be aligning myself with their interest is not mine they are not treating me okay and the idea of being able to coalesce around that identity and to build a political or racial consciousness around it is a project. It's not necessarily natural. And so that is, we've, I've highlighted law or this relationship to legal cases is one thing. One of the criticisms of impact lawyering, the kind of lawyering that I and actually many other people in this room do traditionally is that it was detached from broader political projects of building political consciousness. One of the benefits of critical race theory has been to critique that process and hopefully that we've internalized it. So now rather than just treating these cases as just out in the ether, we hope to see them as part of these broader political pro um, projects. So I highlighted uh, Reina Montoya there because I've worked with her in a number of cases um, in which we have responded to the needs of the community in both legal and non-legal ways and try to be more of engaged partners with them um, and to build in their messaging to center their voices. It's not a perfect process. Law is, can still be alienating and the, the legal process can still be alienating. But I think what we have attempted to do is, is try to help people understand a sense of collective identity and destiny and in doing so, um, try to build kind of lasting political so power. I, so I understand again, and one of the things that I do want to unpack it, maybe in a second round of questions about the relationship between law and rights and whether again law is as effective as we think it is and whether we should bank on law for, so, for social justice uh, movements generally speaking. Um, uh, but on this question about, I, I love the response that you have about, well, look, it, it, maybe it is natural, but again, anytime you're doing a critical project, you have to actually ask yourself, really, is it natural? How, how to think about what we think to be natural and to actually challenge what parts are constructed by political and social forces. Um, and so if you actually go in with that sensibility, maybe you can push back on it and reshape what it is that we actually want to be. I'm curious for the people who are teaching outside of law uh, uh, on this topic of comparative racialization. When students hit this kind of book and this kind of analysis for the first time, do they realize that there are these choice points of being in kind of a liminal existence? Like I, I can either identify white or non-white. I can identify to try to pass or not pass. There are pressures and forces that will incline me in one direction or another and different kinds of opportunities depending on what you look like, what your class is, what part of the geography that you inhabit. Do students have aha moments where they think about that choice differently because they read the book? If you have experiences, I'd love to hear how students respond to it. So Jenna, you, you teach this book. Tell, tell us uh, how students respond to that question. Yeah, and I, I think I'll respond a little bit in combination. We were told to really speak into the microphone, so I'll move it over here. <laughs> and um, maybe a combination of, of both of your questions, which are really you know, thought-provoking and big, I think. Um, I think for me, one of the takeaways and some things I try to instill in my students is that what we can see from this book that spans this really in, important but also broad time period is that one thing that's consistent over that span of time and that I think we see in the promise or, or in the, the present is the false promise huh. of that entry into whiteness, that it's always liminal, it's tenuous, it can be taken away, it has been taken away. Um, and I think something that the book does really beautiful is its attentiveness to power differentials. And I think that's what our students are thinking about. What are their... Um, what is their positionality, where is their privilege, where might be their disadvantage in terms of their ability to lay like, claim to some of those privileges. But ultimately, I think the takeaway is that um, buying into it yeah. doesn't work <laughs> in the long run. Um, and it undermines the collective good. So they're selling you a bill of goods. Maybe it is, again, an, an, a, a strategy of divide and conquer. It's a false set of promises. The emperor wears no clothes to mix more metaphors. But um, OK, so w what do you say, Cassandra? What do you think about this? 
Um, I think that's a, a, a definitely a hard question to answer. Um, and when I teach uh, Laura Gomez's work, but also just the idea of elevating one group over another as a divide and conquer strategy that ultimately, you know, supports uh, white supremacy. I'm talk. I'm mostly talking to um, most of my students are white in my race classes, and so even recognizing uh, their privilege is is kind of like a step before I can even get to thinking about. Um, you know, for example, the model minority myth. Um, but I do think, um, just like uh, Jenna had said, that, you know, um, I also want to back up. In terms of Arizona, in terms of its, like, racialized context, and it's very different from California in terms of, you know, a lot of my Mexican-American, Hispanic students are getting different messages. Um, and I would say it's, it's more of a hostile context, so it's even more... Um, of an effort in terms of my Hispanic or my Mexican American students to fit in, you know, to not ruffle feathers, to not stand out because of assumptions of uh, being immigrant and possibly undocumented. Um, but like uh, Jenna was saying, you know, I definitely also try to instill in my students that, you know, buying into this elevation of one group over another is, you know, it's a false, it's a false promise um, at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay, so um, one more set of questions that then, yeah, you know, forgive me, but we're at a law school, so let's talk a little bit about law. Part, part of it is, um, for people who don't know, critical race theory actually is in some ways, you know, a spinoff and connected to a prior intellectual movement called critical legal studies. One of the commitments or tenets of critical legal studies was, I think, a sharp critique on the role of rights discourse, whether or not... Uh, this idea of a right uh, encapsulated and protected by positive law can do the work of social justice movements. And there was a sharp critique saying that, no, we should abandon rights discourse. It might not do everything that we think. That, too, might be a false promise. A lot of folks of color who were sympathetic to the larger project thought, yeah, rights won't win everything, but they're kind of important. Uh, uh, we might need that as well. And so there's this kind of tenuous embrace, an ironic embrace oftentimes of legal systems, where there's a constant code switching, where we sometimes recognize things just won't work, power's important, uh, we can't get everything, and yet we don't want to give up the possibility of using law to further rights. Now, I, I know that every civil rights organization has to inhabit this space. I'm just wondering for the non-lawyers uh, on the panelists to start this off. When you read this book and see the connection between law, the construction of race, and what could actually be done to promote social justice, does it make you more optimistic about the role of law? Or do you, does it make you more pessimistic about the role of law? Uh, do you think law is where the action's at, and you can see why people want to go to law school? Or you're like, fools, don't go to law school. Uh, uh, do something else. Go into, I don't know, investment banking or other stuff. Get resources. Or go into teaching. Uh, so the idea is just the relationship between law and social change and whether um, this book makes you feel, I guess, more optimistic about the power of law or more pessimistic or uh, all of the above. We'll start with the non lawyers, and then I want to hear what uh, Nicholas has to say. I'll go ahead and start. Um, I do think the law is powerful, um, and I, you know, in Arizona, in terms of, like, attacks on critical race theory, um, you know, Tom Horn, who, Tom Horn, who also played a role in SB 1070, he successfully, um, you know, he's now a superintendent of Tempe School Distri District, and he um, has now allowed Prager University, which is a conservative think tank, um, to allow them to have to uh, be part of the curriculum in in Tempe. So, like their YouTube videos are considered like legitimate educational information. Um, and so, I do think like um, in that space, you know, law and action can be very powerful. Um, but I also think um, how can law and action help us with the politicization or the popularity of anti CRT uh, among voters? So I think about that as yeah. well. So you think like legal attempts to say, hey, that's censorship, that violates the First Amendment, that that's an important potential strategy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Jenna? Say fools, all of you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, for me, I, I think of this as with any power structure, law, government policy, it's always about who is using it, who is wielding law, who is crafting it, who is seeing how it's implemented and 
Um, in this moment, I feel hopeful because I heard Oriel speak earlier today, mm -hmm. and I have Nico here to my left, and you know these are the people that I want influencing law, and I think that it's not an accident that um, you know social advocates have often focused as law as an avenue where they can see you know um, shift power structure, but also. Organizing around law is a way to galvanize people around a common cause that has its ripple effects in law, but also outside of it. Um, so I, I think the important takeaway is that it's an important tool, um, but it depends on context and um, it's not the only tool. And if that's the only thing we're wielding, then we won't be successful. Yeah, Nico, brief comments, reactions to what your colleagues just said. I thank you for your optimism. Uh, I, I, I will acknowledge, earlier today, I sent a text to someone who's in the room to say, I don't believe in law, I don't know why I practice it. Um, uh, do was, spill the tea. I this, hope it this, was, this was in thinking through preparation for a second <laughs> Trump uh, term and what we could do as lawyers to try to deflect it. Um, that's a little bit of hyperbole, but... Yeah. but I am well, well, like, ensconced in the CRT camp, which is rights discourse may or may not be useful, but when we have to deploy it, let's deploy it because we, our communities are embattled and we need to hold on to whatever life raft we can if I'm getting Patricia Williams' uh, metaphor uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. correct. So that's where I stand. Yeah. As long as it keeps working, I'll keep doing it. Um, but I yeah. don't really believe that it will win the day in the end. Yeah, well, and again, you know, whether anything works is always as compared to what. And yeah, so, sorry. again, we want a broad uh, tool set, toolkit uh, in our uh, – um, in our um, <laughs> entire set of tricks and – and, um, and laborers. Um, so, hey, I, I realize we're essentially out of time, but I do want to be able to take at least uh, one or maybe two uh, questions from the audience and then go a little bit uh, over if necessary. So, hands. So, we'll start here. And either, if you can, oh, we've got mics. Hello. Hi, my name is Xiomara Corpeño. I've been an immigrant rights organizer for a long time. Great to see everybody. Um, I want to say that a legal strategy is nothing without base building and without also dominant, like shifting dominant worldview. And th look, this goes to all three of you, but because you brought up the example, um, Nicholas, it was like the piece around the New York Times and the historical context. So I have uh, a friend who came in the 2018 caravans who's in undocumented in Texas who's like, well, but Trump's a businessman. And he's like, and what am I going to do? And I have a nephew who's 23 in Vegas who goes every 10 days to go build the border wall and is like, Trump is a business person. I support him. None of these are voters. And then I have my cousin who came undocumented and is now a citizen, doesn't vote either, but male Latino, dark skin, who's like, a Trump supporter. And so some, like, I just kind of, what's the through line? We have, and they know what I do. So they don't talk to me about that stuff. And we just, <laughs> so like, yeah, how does the historical context then come with how people, are, and I think you were trying to get to this, this thing. It's like, I don't think they're, they're not thinking they're white, but I feel like, are they buying into like American exceptionalism? I will pull myself by my bootstraps or, cause I don't think that they're seeing the promise that they're going to be seen as white. So I'm just wondering like kind of, how do, you, how do you, what do you all think about that? So any reactions to that uh, <clears throat> very detailed, uh, painful reality potentially for people who are shocked uh, at choices that people make close to them? Go, Jenna. All right. Um, it was directed at you. Oh. Um, so I'm sure that there are friends on some chat group with my tío Manuel um, <laughs> as well. Um, so... <laughs> I wasn't able to get to this in my presentation, but we have this dominant narrative, and we all know that, that this is the reality, just as anti-blackness is a reality, just as um, anti-immigrant sentiment is a reality within um, many portions of the Latino community. However, we, I think we need to look at data a little more to understand the dynamics that what are happening. Um, so 
we know what the exit polls say. The exit polls aren't, aren't really accurate. The best information that we have is done with ecological regressions of actual elections. And so, for example, the, na the major narrative about the 2020 election nationwide, including Arizona, was that Trump got about like a third of Latino vote. It was probably closer to like 22%. That's a big difference. Like if you told any politician in the world that they were going to get 78% of a, of a particular demographic, they would be thrilled. And that is, what, um, that is what Joe Biden got in Arizona in the presidential election. And so I think that there's, there needs to be, one, a question about what is the actual facts on the ground, what's happening. But then also like – but that doesn't allow us to escape this reality that you're talking about, which is I think directly tied to – the wages of whiteness um, that we see talked about in Manifest Destiny, this promise of whiteness, the ability to hopefully um, hopefully cash in on it. So my Theo Manuel is the worst off member of my family. He's the most conservative. And I think it's because he does, he's probably feels the most disempowered and he's looking for a populist character who he can then help blame his problems on. And then he can also blame it on black people. He can blame it on the immigrants. And he's hoping to buy into this as a promise of potentially making himself better. That's one data point. That, well, that's one anecdote, and, not even data. And, any other comments? Because I'm really i going to be respectful of time. Yeah. I, just, I think it's interesting in terms of people who both have liberal and restrictionist attitudes. They still comment on whether uh, um, that they want deserving, not undeserving immigrants. So that's across the spectrum. And I also think about um, just especially in Arizona, as, as well as other states, just uh, – I think in general, people tend to have lean more liberal in their immigration attitudes. And I think uh, I think it has to do with something with voter suppression. So if you're having and voter suppression disproportionately affects people who tend to be Democrat in general. And so when I think about the case of Arizona and you're voting on immigration policies, who is it that it's harder for them to access the ballot? And it tends to be. It's, you know, it's a layered thing. So it's the, you know, Democrats in terms of political ideology, but also thinking about uh, rural populations, indigenous populations. And so I, for some reason, my mind goes to thinking about voter suppression, uh, just in terms of pulling back like all the layers to think about, you know, when people are going to the polls, who, the, who are actually making it. Yeah. Jenna, last comment. Something real quick, I'll just um, uplift some great scholarship. There's a new book on Latino conservatives by a scholar named Jerry Cadava um, that is part of this genealogy that, that Dr. Gomez has built. And the other thing I think of is you had mentioned that you know they aren't necessarily identifying as white. And I think of, um, well, what is like white and whiteness? And I think here it's still about that bundle of privileges and power that come with a type of... Um, that it's still very, very racialized, but especially in Manifest Destinies, like we can see like where in law, like those, that bundle of privileges was um, dependent on that white status. So there's something that over time it has changed, but they are still inextricably linked, even if they're not identifying as white per se. Uh, given uh, the time, and I know that uh, there's supposed to be a break, so uh, I, I want to uh, close out this panel. I thought we had an extraordinary list of speakers. You could just see the sets of conversations that this extraordinary book could actually trigger. And the most important thing is the amount of, frankly, respect and love uh, that uh, we all have for Laura uh, and her ideas. Uh, much respect. Okay, I'm going to just ask everyone to have a seat um, and settle down so we can get started on our second panel. And I just want to welcome everybody back from the break. It's wonderful to see such a full room on a Friday afternoon, a beautiful afternoon, but we have much more going on inside this room than anything that Los Angeles can offer at the moment outside. Um, and on this panel, we're going to explore the implications of inventing Latinos, a new story of American racism. Um, but first, I want to thank first the organizers, Justine Coley especially, and Aida Hagigatu, who have done an amazing uh, job of putting together materials. And
and of course of bringing us together, as well as the UCLA Latinx Law Students and the Chicano Latinx Law Review and the Critical Race Studies Program as a whole. Um, and I'm so grateful for the words of Dean Waterstone that opened uh, this day of um, celebration and of Cheryl Harris and of the panel that just uh, came before us. It is really an incredible honor for me to be here, to be able to join in this gathering and to be amongst these illustrious uh, scholars uh, celebrating Laura's work. And I want to just say a little bit about her and our relationship before I turn to the panel. Um, from the day that Laura returned to UCLA in 2011, she became one of my closest friends on the faculty and closest friends in life, and I am so grateful, I will always be grateful to UCLA first and foremost for having brought her into my life. But also I came to understand almost immediately upon meeting her how much I already owed her even before I met her as a co-founder of the Critical Race Studies program, which became a collective at this law school that gave me, but also so many other generations of students and young scholars, a genuine institutional home in which we could both thrive and feel supported and benefit from the collective wisdom of our seniors and of the solidarity that they offered us within the institution and the space to think in truly critical ways, which again, I also found myself having to model uh, on somebody like Laura, who is just extraordinary at navigating institutions, at navigating the faculty, but also at really parsing arguments and getting to the core, to the heart, to the most incisive point in any given interaction and enabling the rest of us to build on her brilliant insights. She is, of course, needless to say, and we already know this even before this panel begins, an expert on race, law, and society. And her books, as we've already heard, are instantly canonical. Um, all three, Misconceiving Mothers, which I'm happy uh, that Cheryl also acknowledged, Manifest Destinies and Investing, Inventing Latinos that we'll be discussing today. And they make it not only uh, in the ways that we've already discussed, incredibly um, productive in conversations across not just law, but sociology, political science, anthropology, and beyond, critical studies across the social sciences. Uh, but they also have crossed over because they grow as they do out of the lived experiences of the communities that she's writing about. They cross into the possibility of igniting the popular imagination, and it's this that I really think is extraordinary. It's an accomplishment that very few academics are capable of, which is writing a, a field-defining new work that speaks to scholarly audiences, that is taught at the graduate level across the country, and also can be and should be read by every American citizen. And it's in this sense, I think, that we should recognize that something like uh, 2020 NPR Best Book Award, things like that are meaningful. They're meaningful not necessarily because we think this or that award is so significant, but because the voice is coming across to so many different audiences, and that's really something worth celebrating and marking at any given moment. I also want to say personally, Laura was the vice dean at the law school during my tenure process, and so she held my hand and you know, got me through what I, what I experienced, at least personally, as an extraordinarily anxiety-inducing uh, experience but with a vice dean who genuinely, I believe her uh, title was something like vice dean for intellectual life and something, faculty cultivation maybe, but in any case, really was at the heart of intellectual life and who could engage, were in very different fields. Um, at the end of the day, I was being substantively, substantively evaluated for work in international law, but my drafts always benefited from the critical eye and the close reading that I got from Laura Gomez, and I will be eternally grateful for that. And then later, um, post-tenure, as I served as the director for the Center for Near Eastern Studies here at UCLA, she was uh, the interim uh, dean of social sciences at the university. And again, I had an opportunity to work hand in glove with her as like a kind of neophyte, trying to find my way around university-wide kind of research collaborations, and had her guidance and assistance in trying to build new programs around, for example, displaced scholars and scholars at risk, which she assisted in and now has been institutionalized at this university in so many ways, including through the work of my successor, who's here in the audience, over Ali Behtad, at the Center for Near Eastern Studies, where we continue to support everything from Kurdish to Afghan to, I hope, Palestinian scholars at this university who have been displaced um, by you know, the horrific circumstances in the region that I study in the Middle East. 
Laura is only a few sen years my senior. I said all these things as if she's this like incredible mentor, which she is, and that's because it's not measured by age. She's generations ahead of me in her achievements, and I will always have to look up to her and hope, aspire one day to achieving uh, anything even close to what she has managed to accomplish in the short time uh, that she's been here, in fact, with us. She has decades more of incredible work ahead of her, in my view, and in, in a sense, it's our loss at UCLA, but in, in another sense, it's her wisdom to choose to take this moment to pivot in her career and in her uh, scholarly life and focus on uh, a, at least a geography where she has family, friends, and intellectual community that will continue to support her in her new adventures. Um, I want to say, though, that one of the lessons, and this is now a transition to Inventing Latinos, that is really, I think, indelible in particularly the Inventing Latinos work is the degree to which the production of race and the role of the United States as an imperial actor and empire are imbricated. And that's a lesson that I have taken with me through my own scholarship. Indeed, in this very room, we held a symposium that brought critical race theorists together with theorists that think about international law from the perspective of third world approaches that was called race and empire, precisely um, an homage to the exact uh, kind of imbricated logic that Laura explores so brilliantly in the book. And so I will say that wherever she may be, and wherever I may be for that matter, I will continue to not only use and learn from her work, but remain her mentee for the remainder of my career. And I think many in this room share that sentiment, and that was one of the most beautiful things for me of uh, being able to watch the previous panel. But with that, let me turn to her uh, colleagues and cohort who are on this panel with me uh, today. And it's also a great honor for me to be here because I get to share this stage with them. You all have programs in front of you, and so you're able to read their longer bios. In order to save time, given the amount of the panel I've already spent on my own remarks, I'm just going to give their most um, abbreviated um, titles, and I'm going to just introduce them all, and then they will speak in order, um, in the order that I'm presenting them now. So Walter Allen first, uh, immediately to my left, is Distinguished Professor of Education, Sociology, and African American Studies, and Alan Murray Carter Chair in Higher Education at the UCLA School of Education and Information Sciences. Next to him is Shirin Razak, Distinguished Professor and Penny Canner Endowed Chair in the Department of Gender Studies here at UCLA. And then uh, to her left is Saul Sarabia, Academic Coordinator, UCLA Institute for Research and Labor and Employment, a UCLA Law alum from the class of 1996, and I have to say also my partner in crime from the day that I arrived at this school. Uh, we worked hand in hand. Uh, when he was the program director at the Critical Race Studies program, and he is a lifelong comrade. So he will always be the furthest left, I think, on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Although all of my colleagues on this panel are my comrades, and I'm so, so delighted to be on this panel together with them. And with that, Walter, I give you the floor. Good afternoon. I am just delighted to, to be a part of this uh, gathering. I uh, have to share a, a funny story that's been circulating within the uh, panel. Um, comments were made by Dr. Harris about uh, Ladder's uh, just the fact that she's a, a, an administrative maven. She really makes sure that all the pieces are in place and everything is organized. So she had for us an orientation to this panel just so that we could work through what we were going to do. Well, as it turns out, I thought that was the presentation. So I dressed up in my suit. I left my, uh, we were on Zoom. I dressed up in my suit and I left my athletic shorts on. I came prepared with my presentation and I went through my presentation and about 15, 20 minutes in, I said, wait, wait, <laughs> this is the, this is the trial run. So it was, uh, I had to run, I had to share that with you. But for once, I'm, I'm, I was prepared on time. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll read my comments to try to get through them in the time that is allotted. Uh, first, giving thanks. I begin with acknowledgments and expressions of gratitude, thanking the session organizers, the School of Law, this audience of students, scholars, colleagues, and community, community members. Uh, as we have all benefited from the contributions of the amazing person that we are gathered here to honor the wonderful scholar, teacher, social advocate, activist, humanist, and person that you are. 
we gather here today to recognize, celebrate, and thank you, Professor <laughs> Gomez, uh, for all that you have done and continue to represent for us. I was asked to make a few comments on the book, Inventing Ra Latinos, A New Story of American Racism. That book, when it appeared, was both revelation and revolution. The brilliant book soared as it seamlessly bridged the presumed gaps between legal theory, deliberate statistical analysis, and am I not being heard? I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, you missed my joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't repeat. The, the book literally soared as it seamlessly bridges uh, the presumed gaps between legal theory, uh, rigorous empirical analysis, social policy, and the lived experiences of common everyday folk. Since its publication in 2020, Inventing Latinos has been a foundational text in the graduate seminar I teach titled Theories of Race and Ethnicity. Each time I return to the book, I learn something new. And it is, it is really just, a, 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 just such a joy to see the students wrestle with, or in humanist terms, Lada, dance with the ideas that she presents as she critiques the old wine of racism, conquest, colonialism, and white supremacy, which is now being served up in new bottles of colorblind racism, laissez-faire capitalism, and what have you. Uh, one reviewer, Jennifer Dom Domino Rudolph, overviews and distills the book's central arguments as follows. The book combines critical race theory with an overview of the historical interventions of the United States in Latin America from the 19th century to the present, all in the service of racial capitalism. Gomez presents a compelling argument to prove how enslavement, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism interlock in the construction of the U.S. racial hierarchy, a hierarchy from which Latino has emerged as an intermediary category between black and white and as harbinger to the future of racial formation in the United States, end of the quote. Now, discussing inventing Latinos in a 2020 UCLA magazine article, Dr. Pro Professor Gomez emphasized the following goals of the book to clear up misconceptions. That is, points such as contrary to popular notions, seven out of 10 Latinos are Mexican Americans, and 80% of them are born in the US. Also, while the US Census does not include Latino as a racial under the option under, of, under race, most Latinos view the term as their racial identity. She emphasizes the long history of Latinos in the United States and their growing presence and influence on America, in and on American society. She emphasizes one goal being to explicate. That is, explicate how, for example, race was and is, was invented and is being reinvented. Europeans used the social constructions, race and racism to justify imperialism, conquest, and colonialization of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Murder and rape were among the instruments used to implement a global system of racial capitalism that valued gold, silver, oil, and wealth over the lives of darker people. A second goal, to recognize that also, although race is socially constructed, invented, if you will, racism, that is the coordinated intersecting superstructure of historical, social, economics, political, environmental, and hegemonic factors exerts extraordinary influence, implicitly and implicitly, over people across time and space. Race, the illusion, has very real felt, lived, physical, social, economic, and political consequences. If you believe in voodoo, then spells can be cast upon you. To understand was a third major objective that she highlighted. To understand how the process of racialization, which is a, that involves sorting people into racial categories, is bound up in racial capitalism, which leverages the racial divide and racial hierarchy to maximize exploitation and profit. 
she clarifies how the presence of Latinos complicates <coughs> and challenges the black, white, racial binary, foundational to the racial democracy, a democracy that really applied to landed white males that is articulated in the US Constitution. And lastly, on the point she, rec she emphasized, another point she emphasized was to acknowledge and compensate, if you will, the many injuries to Americans of different hues, blacks, Latinos, Asians, the indigenous, flowing from the destructive, exploitative, soul-crushing wrath of racial capitalism. Professor Gomez advocates economic reparations for African Americans whose ancestors were captured, enslaved, and stripped of humanity, and pathways to citizenship for undocumented Latinos whose sovereignty was erased by historical conquest of their land, labor, and personhood. On the international scale, rapar reparations would entail transfer or return of wealth stolen from the global, global south by the global north. Speaking as a non-educated and non-qualified, non-certified lawyer, it seems to me that tort law, and or certainly some interpretations of such, argue persuasively in favor of compensation for injuries of commission and omission inflicted by the systematic exploitation and impoverishment of black and colored people who are and have been at the bottom of the well, as Derek Bell pointed out. Ultimately, this suite of coordinated intersecting actions enriched whites and Europeans at the top of the racial hierarchy through impoverishment of their lesser brethren. Simple physical fact, uh, metaphysical fact, the concentration of poverty is inevitably uh, accompanied by the concentration of wealth, or the concentration of wealth produces the concentration of poverty. Now, moving a step back and just uh, offering some other thoughts about inventing Latinos. The book is, in, is simultaneously a sociological, historical, <coughs> social policy, and legal treatise, enriched with humanist perspectives and sensibility. Professor Gomez skillfully demonstrates how multiple sectors intersect and organize as race, an imaginary construct, becomes powerfully real in its consequences for lived realities in our society. I am reminded of this in this respect of the significant ways the eminent scholar, intellectual, and activist, w. E. B., Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, brought multiple disciplines to bear in his revealing studies of race and political economy in America. Now that analog occurred to me for the simple fact that we, first for the simple fact that the book is very reminiscent of his analyses and <coughs> perspectives and approaches, but also because I am uh, out of time. <laughs> because, because I am, uh, I am finishing along with a group of colleagues the Oxford Handbook on W. E. B. Du Bois, and as I read and as we worked through the pieces, I kept thinking about its connections and 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 overlaps. Uh, Lada, um, to accomplish this daunting task. Professor Gomez's historical analysis traces the roots of Latino identity to Spanish colonization in the New World, and we heard the discussion of Manifest Destiny. This emerging contrived identity was tied to the importation of African slaves who replaced the labor of indigenous people decimated by the European onslaught intent on extracting wealth. Inventing Latinos is a groundbreaking study which systematically examines how the relatively new collective racial identity of Latino and Latinas challenges scholarly, culture, and political convention. She addresses scholarly and popular attempts to define Latinos, that is, who are they, and their place in America, where and how do they fit in this society. Professor Gomez makes effective use of the perspectives and tools of critical race th studies to reframe and refocus. Is that my, am I out of time? Oh, good. Don't worry. 
to, to reframe and refocus how confused, contradictory discussions, uh, uh, to reframe and refer, refocus confused and contradictory discussions of Latinos. She systematically demonstrates how toxic policies, rhetoric, and conventions have simultaneously impacted internal and external definitions of Latinos. Now, importantly, Professor Gomez shows how these factors have forced a broader rethinking beyond Latino communities, driving insightful reconsiderations of race in America as both illusion and reality. This outstanding book will continue to have long-term broad influence. I applaud and thank you, Professor Gomez, for writing this courageous, insightful book at this critical moment for race, racism, and racial capitalism in American society. Inventing Latinos will not only play an essential role in advancing efforts to rewrite racial histories and interpretations of Latinos, but more broadly, race and racial identities in America and the world. So, Lada, as you embark on your next adventure, and I know you won't go anywhere and sit down. You're going to be busy. I wish you joy, peace, and prosperity. May the wind always be at your back. And we love you and appreciate you, sister. Is this working? Yeah? Closer. Okay. Um, Thank you to the organizers, to Jasleen, to CRS for inviting me. It's, it, I really feel proud to be in this company. And, you know, given half a chance, I would probably spend the next 10 minutes sort of complaining and whining. Laura has abandoned me. I'm now here. <laughs> that kind of thing. But, but I, I think I really have to honor the spirit that has been so beautifully rendered today. Uh, a real celebration of who she is. And I'm... I'm so pleased. So Laura and I met, and I was trying to think if it was 1993 or not, it was 94, 93, at a critical race theory workshop where I, I think I, I was the only Canadian scholar there studying issues of race and law. And that's important because you have to understand what it feels like when a scholar from outside the U.S. comes in and has conversations. Everyone has to study the U.S., but when you come in and have conversations with scholars here, that's really quite significant. I'm also a Trinidadian from the English-speaking Caribbean, and so I have some kind of intimate knowledge or affinity with the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. So, uh, you know, in that workshop, I discovered, first of all, that I could pass as Latina. <laughs> So, so this was my first invitation to think about this, this category of American life and this category in law. So apart from a friendship that I hold very dear, Laura's work very early on began to give me some really significant insights into the American racial project, and some, so much of this has, has been said. These insights remain of vital importance to to all of us, to, to critical race scholars, it's literally changed the landscape. I really worry about her departure from this law school, and I want to agree with the student earlier. This is this is really worrying that this gap is left here um, with with her departure. But I know that her contributions have changed the landscape of scholarship and of politics uh, as well. So some time ago, I wrote a, a review of Manifest Destinies, and, and, and in that I did um, comment on what people have said here today, which is the American racial project is typically understood as a black-white racial project. Occasionally, you get somebody talking about colonial dispossession, indigenous dispossession, etc., but really a black-white paradigm. and, and you really need scholars to, to, to bring in this notion, not in any kind of inclusive gesture, but really to insist that this racial project is a complex and fluid system in which every group's status, from recently arrived immigrants to white ethnic groups, is all overdetermined by race and by anti-blackness. And you really can't grasp this unless you see everyone's position on, on the landscape. So I found, you know, with, with Manifest Destinies that, that I could begin to think about this landscape in all its complexities. And, and importantly, and I think people have said this too, is that that book gave uh, 
the racial strategies of American colonizers. But it also really crucially thought about the responses of the first Amer Mexican Americans as they navigated this colonial racial order. And for me, most important, important of all was the emphasis on white supremacy. Like, what is it? It appears in this book as a, a chessboard in which all groups are playing this, this race game that they're obliged to, to play. But because of this attention to uh, what you know, many, and I think Laura herself calls it the sort of buffer zone that, that you find uh, Mexican Americans and Latinos in, it really pushed scholars like me who, who in, and uh, when uh, Manifest Destinies came out, I was writing a book about anti-Muslim racism and I've since written a second book on that, and it, it was really important to kind of think about how it is that anti-Muslim racism upholds white supremacy. And Laura's uh, book makes it really clear that what happens to this category that we call Mexican and Latinos is entirely in the interest of this project of white supremacy. So. When that we moved from Manifest Destinies to the making of Latino as a race, it, it felt, first of all, an extraordinarily timely intervention, uh, just in thinking about the census, because you know that was then the issue. So what did I get out of this? First of all, I like to repeat the numbers that are in the book, and that might put me over my time, so I'm worried about that. But you know, can you imagine when you don't know much about the United States, and people in the United States don't reckon with this, that you, you have to think about 60 million people who are in this category. That's a lot of people. And then you, you know, when you begin to think that four out of 10 Latinos opt for other on the form, you really have to do some thinking to, make, to, to understand what that racial, what that choice might, might be about. Um, and for me, you know, it was a, real, uh, a really important demonstration that this large group of people don't find themselves on the state's racial tableau, or maybe they object to its categories. We don't know. But what we do know is that there are all these assumptions, some of which uh, was talked about earlier, that all they're doing is trying to get into whiteness somehow. You know, this, uh, so, so what Inventing Latinos gave me and gave us all was a way to get past some of these immediate knee-jerk reactions about these kinds of figures and really start thinking about what this category is. And most importantly, to keep remembering that something like the census is a means of managing racial populations. It's not just a, a record. And so um, I feel like you know, there are lessons here that, that we have to keep repeating out loud because they're, get, they're under so much attack. One is that the racial classification system exists in order to maintain white supremacy. People define themselves and the state defines them and it's a kind of tug of war about who counts. Secondly, we cannot interpret Latino lives entirely within an analysis that suggests that they're just simply disavowing blackness and indigeneity on every turn. <coughs> what options are there for Latinos politically what should their race politics entail? I think this is what I just began. I felt forcefully pulled in that direction to think about that through this book, to think about the multiple logics of white supremacy, but in this really detailed way. And so for me, um, Inventing Latinos, you know, when it talks about the two origin stories of the American racial project, transatlantic slave trade, slavery, and imperialism, um, where it goes from that point is really critical, which is that we have to pay attention to the continuing histories of territorial acquisition that drives hundreds of people displaced from Latin America, for example, northbound. And significantly, beginning with territorial acquisition really requires rejecting the popular idea that Latinos are just oscillating between whiteness and blackness and floating around somewhere in the middle. So I think by starting, as someone said earlier, I think Cheryl, that starting with the idea that Latinos are a conquered and displaced racialized population, like start there, uh, then we are obliged to work out how do they cement the project of white supremacy. 
And in, in, in doing that, the one thing that we know about white supremacy is that it is voracious, that it is a system that just grows and grows and grows. We know that this voraciousness is in, in, in inventing Latinos, we see it. It's a kind of devouring, black killability, corporate colonialism, the forced displacement of people in its path, a continuous indigenous genocide, and what the book calls the exporting of white supremacy to Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. But what this voracious foraging for land and power and consuming people in, in its path, what it does is it, it brings Mexicans into the United States, for example, as the conquered. And this, this rampaging, rampaging and pillaging and terror also brings us governmentalities that keep the racial project afloat, that keep these racial categories very carefully calibrated in the system. And so what I take from this, this book, and I want to, to go there in the rest, rest of, of my, my talk, what I take from this book is to look at that middle ground that is occupied by Mexicans and Latinos, to look at it carefully as a place that is not simply in between black and indigenous and, uh, and white. It, it's, it's not really a buffer zone, it's a killing zone. And I propose the term no man's land as a means to capture the multiple logics of white supremacy. And I like the idea that no man's land is the actual place where we find Latinos, and it's the Latino body itself. Latinos never reside within a regime of citizenship. They're permanently temporary and objects of suspicion. And I want my last three minutes, I'm stealing another minute. I, 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 I want to, to, to put on the table something that has been so uh, relevant to, to me recently. In, you're, you'll recall that no man's land is an actual place, right? The term comes from World War II. It's the area of land between two enemy, tr enemy trenches. If you crossed it, you were at risk of being killed. So inventing Latinos really requires us to think about that space, that land where you're at risk of being killed all the time. And I was actually, when I proposed this, I, I had this idea when I was reviewing the, the book um, a, a year ago, when I proposed this idea of no man's land, I turned to an article by um, Emily Drumster and Keith Feldman in which they discuss another no man's land, which is the barren land between Lebanon and Israel that the black writer and feminist June Jordan described as a space where Palestinians uh, are taken after being seized from their homes by the Israeli military. And in, in this, this no man's land, what these authors are arguing is that we can't afford to ignore these kinds of spaces, these no man's land, because we need to understand how they secure white supremacy, how they secure settler colonialism. We won't understand, they say, it, the practices of capture and confinement if we don't look at that space in that really specific way that inventing Latinos gives us. And these, these authors also remind us that Palestinian men who were taken to no man's land re began to resist by forming a, a trans-territorial affiliation. They insisted on living where no man ought to live. They occupied no man's land to which they were confined. They even set up a virtual university. And I want to, to, to take this quite seriously, this consignment of a group to no man's land. Today in Gaza, it's painfully clear where all of this leads. This leads to genocide. This leads to massive killing. So no man's land is a spatial zone where subjects are exposed to premature death. It's also a space outside of the normative juridical order. It's the place where, in the words of these authors, you dispossess, you dehumanize, you incapacitate, and you maim subject population. If that's the space that Latinos and Mexicans are organized, uh, are, are confined to in this racial project, we need to remember seriously what that space is all about, what that targeting of bodies is all about. And just let me end on, on the note that 
Latinos enact a community of resistance, very much like pa the Palestinians referred to in that article, through the very idea of Latinoness in the face of a, an ongoing and a violent deterritorialization that is written on their bodies and that is written on the bodies of Latinos and Mexicans, whoever they are and whether they got here a hundred years ago or five minutes ago. Uh, that continues, and, and we need to um, really draw from what Laura put on the table in this book to pay attention to these middle spaces and how they sustain white supremacy. Buenas tardes, can you hear me okay? Okay, buenas tardes everyone. Uh, like you, I'm so happy to be here today. Um, the great poet Maya Angelou once said that if you have ever had a teacher, then you have an obligation to teach. I got that message from my former teacher, Professor Laura Gomez, when I was working as a community organizer building black brown unity in South Los Angeles at the age of 32. She called to tell me that she was heading back to New Mexico and that she would be forwarding my name to the Cesar Chavez Center for Chicano Studies here to teach her Latinos on the Law course to undergraduates. This moment was especially meaningful to me, not simply because she wasn't asking, rather she was telling me that my name would be forwarded, but because I had been the editor-in-chief of the Chicano Latino newspaper just a decade earlier from that call, during our student body's historic demand for a uh, historic hunger strike, uh, demanding a department in Chicano and Chicano studies. What we were demanding then was the type of rigorous and exacting scholarship that she has done throughout her career mm -hmm. and a structure in which we could connect the dots between the ideas and the actions that are needed in our community. It is my great honor and a rare gift to be able to publicly express my gratitude to my former teacher by being here with all of you to celebrate her contributions to advancing the field of critical race theory. As I've told her, Inventing Latinos is the book I wish I had had growing up, not simply to understand the forces that shape our lives as brown folks in the Americas, but also to enhance, has been said, everybody's understanding uh, about the shape-shifting nature of racism and the tools at our disposal to fight it. Laura has asked me to share a bit of, uh, about our journey together over what now has become three decades of our lives. To share a bit about the work that I do in the realm of community organizing and electoral politics and the relevance of some of the themes in her book to my efforts. Uh, the real title of this talk should be 12 Minutes is Not Enough. <laughs> So I will not accomplish all of that. <clears throat> 30 years ago, I was 24 years old, beginning my second year of law school and sitting in this classroom, others like it. Before graduating, I enrolled in her course, Law and Society, which took place in the same semester as the infamous O.J. Simpson case. I was a rather opinionated participant in that seminar, and I remember Rigorous, deb vigorous debates, among them one in which I held the minority view that unless anyone else in the class had a net worth of $9 million and a long history of distancing themselves from black and brown poor people, then we had little ownership in OJ's not guilty verdict. Both my, uh, I posited that because both my male siblings were incarcerated for drug-related felonies at the time that I was in school, I posited what exactly they and all of the other black and brown prisoners like them um, could do with the symbolism of this case if they were unable to purchase OJ's defense team. Despite my outburst, or, because, or perhaps because of them, Laura invited me to serve as a research assistant to her. She explained that I would be reading and writing uh, about cases that reflected, quote, how the courts in New Mexico became the site of racial contestation after Mexico's northern territories were forcibly incorporated into the United States. I was all in. 
I was unaware that this modest effort by a student would help her later produce what became Manifest Destinies, the book discussed in the previous panel. But I knew that I was in the middle of an almost non-existent experience for a young law student in the United States in the mid-1990s, and that is having a Mexican-American woman studying how our people pushed back against Manifest Destiny and teaching me the skills to build a new story. During my last semester in law school, she invited me and a few classmates to attend the first ever Latino Critical Race Theory Conference in San Diego. This arc of events, debating ideas in a classroom as a student and teacher, engaging in legal research and writing, then steeping ourselves in a shared inquiry with others across the country about Latino racial oppression and the law to help birth a variant of CRT was a transformative experience. What was transformational was not just being seen, but being challenged to see ourselves as intellectual authors of movements, of ideas, and progress. I came to appreciate Lauda's life project in producing knowledge, inspiring future lawyers and law professors, and dismantling the erasure of our people from law books and sociology texts all at once. It struck me as a profound alchemy of her parents' sacrifices, her acumen, and the spirit of all of those sacrificed on the altar of settler and white supremacy, or I guess the no man's land. Years later, she served as one of the first two faculty directors of the CRS specialization here at UCLA, the creation of which was a historic intervention accomplished in coordination with the rest of the CRS faculty soon after affirmative action was ended in California. That is to say, in an era of backlash and retrenchment rooted in disinformation and coordinated ideological attacks not unfamiliar to the one that we are living through today. Being good agitators, the first few classes of CRS students demanded that CRS amount to more than a list of classes, paving the way for the hiring of a CRS administrator position for which I was encouraged to apply. Curiously, the law school administration had imagined administrative to mean something outside of the realm of complexity that comes, <laughs> that comes with serving the remarkable talent that is recruited to the school. The pay was so low and the demand so high that I rejected the first offer. <laughs> I asked the school to consider what they would say to an admitted student that year if the student knew that 10 years after graduating from this law school, an alumnus would command so little for so much work. By the time we came to a meeting of the minds, for the law students who are taking contracts, by the time we came to a meeting of the minds, the position and its pay was reconstituting, allowing me to teach Latinos on the law and critical race theory here. When you have strong mentors, you learn to stand in your power, and you learn that navigating systemic oppression is a dance between our own individual agency and the forces of structural determinism, one of the early tenets of critical race theory. Perhaps the most impactful moment in shaping my professional trajectory, which has centered on using the tools that I acquired here to show up for community residents and students who want to fight for social change and making myself useful to them was just before final exams in my last year of law school. That year, we held a sit-in at a faculty meeting where uh, the faculty voted to end UCLA's diversity admissions program and rejected proposals from students and others to preserve our representation here. The law school administration decided that a statement in support of diversity, not even in support of affirmative action, just diversity, could not be accompanied by the seal of the law school and postcards that students wanted to include, include in the graduation program later that year. Instead, the administration decided that this would be a statement from the graduating class of 1996 itself. I wrote a few scathing op-ed pieces in the Daily Bruin in local newspapers, boycotted the law school's graduation, and redirected my family to participate in the bilingual, culturally affirming, student-run Raza graduation instead that year. Laura affirmed my instinct to act as I felt was necessary in the face of injustice 
rather than admi admonish me for my activism in the middle of the f close to finals, <laughs> close to final exams. Of all the things that happen in this building, I can think of none being more important than nourishing a law student's nourishing a law student's capacity to recognize injustice and to nurture her desire to do something about it. Indeed, it is the most enduring purpose of law school and among Laura Gomez's most significant achievements. I would now like to turn to a brief discussion of the work that I do with this formation. And I'm going to ask Jasmine if she's in the room. She's going to just put up a website that'll be on the background you can visit later um, to learn more about this work. So I'd like to now turn to a brief discussion of the work that I do with this formation and to have been lucky to, to acquire these tools and mentorship from Laura. Having kept one foot in academia and one foot in community-based social justice advocacy, I focus on developing leaders capable of shaping social movements in part by engaging in efforts to change laws and public policies. I'm currently focused on the social movement to abolish youth incarceration in Los Angeles County. For those of you who are local, you may recall reading newspapers, maybe once a week, every couple of weeks, about the parade of horrors that beset the roughly three largely, 300 largely black and brown youth in euphemistically named juvenile halls or secure treat youth treatment facilities. Almost a year ago, an 18-year-old named Brian Diaz died after overdosing in his cell. Last fall, the county chief executive office estimated that we taxpayers may soon be paying between one and three billion dollars in settlements for sexual abuse claims going back decades in these youth facilities. And just this week, a probation officer was arrested for raping a detainee after sending him explicit images of herself. A few weeks ago, state regulators declared these spaces unsuitable to house young people and gave the county until April 16th to stop housing young people in these conditions. The head of the probation department has indicated that LA has no intention to do this because as critical race theory teaches, the rule of law is mediated by relations of power. And in the current equation, children in cages and the low income communities to, from which they hail currently lack the political power to make this regulatory determination real and liberation from these conditions is momentarily beyond reach. In that context, I convene retired staff who have worked in these carceral spaces with adults who were once incarcerated in them during their youth to imagine a future of work in a, in a decarcerated California. This was the name of a course that I had the privilege of co-designing with my partners in African American Studies and Labor Studies. And our point of departure is that caging children diminishes the humanity of both incarcerated youth and the workers recruited by the state to labor in these conditions. You can learn more about the, the work on this website, Decarcerate California, and what you will see is that a subset of students, former staff, and formerly incarcerated youth who enrolled in it decided to keep working together to shape this future. I'm also gonna steal a minute. I wanna end uh, by sharing what you will not see in this website. And that is the invisible and thankless work of one of my former students in Latinos and the Law, here, which I taught here at UCLA. As a lawyer representing this youth, she not only works to free the youth from these conditions, but to end the death-dealing conditions that they and the staff sent to work in these facilities experience. This has meant taking risks to go beyond representation and inviting judges, DAs, policymakers, and the public into the life-affirming project of constructing community-based alternatives where true healing can take place. We neither planned nor predicted that we would be collaborating together at this intersection of court advocacy, systems change, and leadership development. But this arc, of being a student and a teacher in the same classroom, of navigating systems and narratives that resist healing and restorative justice while undergoing, while undoing the legacy of manifest destiny through the juvenile justice system is a chain that Laura set into motion between us in ways that she could not see 30 years ago. It is my understanding that after Laura retires, there will be no Latino professors raised in the United States 
teaching at this law school. I submit to you that this is not simply a representational or a symbolic harm, but a disservice to the concrete and necessary ways that subjects of the racialization processes described by Laura in this book acquire tools to serve as agents against injustice. In the language of community organizing, we call these the ripe conditions for a good old organizing campaign. <laughs> and I am certain that when it arises, we will all thank the law school for giving us the opportunity to find each other so that we could wage it at her retirement symposium. Thank you. Uh, as I sat and listened to the previous panel, um, I promised myself that I would not, as moderator, consume all of our time uh, in the conversation amongst ourselves. And yet, having said that, of course, my te the temptation is to um, great to resist, to at least ask one question for each of you to do with what you would like. I think uh, one thing that really strikes me in listening to all three of your presentations is the degree to which the legacies of La Laura's work are already so evident. So one can place Lauda's work in a canon that stretches from Du Bois to Gomez at some level and think about the ways in which the productive uh, sort of conceptualization of race, race making, unmaking, remaking takes its place in that canon and what it can then um, enable us to think with going forward. We also see its actual ability to travel across geographies in Shirin's work in thinking about no man's lands as they might be constructed both you know, in, in, in a place that base, where, as you say, race and war intersect, not only at the borders of the United States, but at so many other borders from here to Gaza and beyond. And we can also see the extraordinary legacy of her work, first of all, in your person, Saul, and in the stories you just told us about what you have done with the tools that you gained from Laura and from this school in the Critical Race Studies program. So what I wanted to ask is for each of you to maybe reflect on how you think about the legacy of Laura's work, whether through the students and the generations that she has influenced, uh, we had a conversation earlier, uh, Saul, about the relationship between what you've learned from her and her students, and you're thinking about recent scandals in Los Angeles. I would invite you to think about that or share that with us. And Shireen, what you think in the context of law and society and beyond law and society, how Lauda's work has been generative for an entire way of thinking, including this idea that you left us with, which is the deterritorialization that is imprinted on the bodies of racialized subjects and how that, how that helps us think about borders and borderlands. And Walter, we ended the last panel in thinking about grappling with anti-blackness and grappling with anti-immigrant sentiment even within the project of race formation because precisely that racial classification serves the purposes of entrenching white supremacy as you mentioned. Um, and we see that itself being reproduced um, within the Latino community. And so I wonder if we could all say a word or two um, and then we'll take at least one question. And so I'm following very much in the esteemed uh, footsteps of uh, Jerry Kong, uh, and that's always a very good place to be. Maybe in reverse order. Okay, I'm not sure if this is on. Um, I want to center the the uh, instruction, I guess I'll call it that, or the um, lesson that arises about doing multiracial solidarity work. Um, and the concept in critical race theory, race theory, which is called the anti-subordination principle, as a guiding light for thinking about how we do the work of navigating white supremacy today. To me, the legacy of the intellectual work that Laura has done, the spaces that have been created. Um, in, in a law school like this, it's so extraordinary, even as you think about the attacks on critical race theory, that we're sitting in an institution that has the only, but also um, incredibly deep uh, things going on that happen when you create for law students a space for them to think critically and hard about the problem of race, but also the problems that they came here and are now paying way more money than I paid just a short time ago to try to do something about. And so for me, that legacy 
is one in the context of Latino empowerment that explicitly rejects the fiction that our demographics, that our um, numerical hegemony, if you want to call it that, in some areas like the neighborhoods I went to high school in, which are largely Latino, um, are going to actually uh, deliver justice to us and that there's um, a limited type of justice that comes from uh, suggesting as people who were caught on the tapes, uh, the now infamous tapes that I had hoped to talk about but deserve a whole other conference. Um, and you hear it very brazenly there. And it's, it's significant to me that it, as somebody who's in labor studies, that it's not just three elected officials, but the head of the most powerful engine, political engine, that ties the Latino demographic majority in a lot of these districts with good old organizing, which is the, the, the labor movement. And so the fact that Ron Herrera was there, that to Ron Herrera, in, in, in a portion of the tapes, he says, one of these black districts needs to become a Latino district, but it cannot be a community coalition district. And that implicates exactly what I was doing. What makes me dangerous as a community coalition Latino was that I have a consciousness about the fact that anti-blackness shapes us, the fact that anti-indigeneity shapes us. And so for me, it is, it is this challenge and legacy to keep our eye on the prize and to know that the challenge is this challenge of using race as coalition in the fight against subordination. It's good to follow that because that's exactly the, the line that I, I would think about when I think of my use of Laura, Laura's work. Uh, one is that regardless of what struggle you're actually um, you know, concentrating on in your work and in your politics, if you don't really understand that total landscape, your own struggle is going to get messed up there. And so it, it seems to me that being handed a tool where I could connect Gaza to what is happening here at the border and connect that in, in such a detailed way that I can't miss the details. Uh, I think that that is, you need it for organizing as, as, as you're saying. People have to understand that their situation is actually the same one. They're all stuck in this project of voracious whiteness and, and, and white supremacy. And, but they need to understand that at a very deep emotional level. And I don't think you can get there unless you understand the specifics of each group. And you know, just having moved to LA um, just a few years ago, it, it, it is quite stunning to an outsider that no one understands this space that Mexicans and Latinos are in. And this is a city that's 60%. This is, this, this is something that is unbelievable to grasp, to even process. So you can imagine the political challenge of, of these groups together. Um, and so I, I just feel, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but I feel like if we understand something like this, Deterritorialization on the body. Uh, Asla, I'm glad you, you you noted that that was the, the core thing I wanted to, to put on the table. I think if you understand that even if it's not your body, it's happening to your body in a different way, I, I think that's where we have to do our organizing. And, and you can't do it without this kind of scholarship. You just can't. And I would simply join my uh, colleagues' reflections by Reemphasizing how your work plus you, the person, had this sort of connectedness that was not only about the scholarship, it was the scholarship, it was both and the scholarship, the sort of practice in terms of teaching and mentorship, and then the activism and how those pieces fit together, and thus the, the connectedness with a, um, a framing of Du Bois. Because literally, we're talking about a, a long arc of struggle, um, because it is a long process of of, of, of creation and, and implementation and, and reinstitution of, 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 of white supremacy, and so it it is just very encouraging and, and hopeful that we have a model, and that we have 
sort of the sense of a continuity because the efforts to oppress, the efforts to defend that territory of white supremacy you know, will, are relentless. And as such must also be the efforts to, to destabilize and, and to um, combat the uh, machinery that has been centuries uh, put in place. And so it, uh, it's just encouraging and uh, very useful to have the tools. And as I said, not only the tools, but the model of a career and a person who, who um, embodies what we can do uh, to resist and resist successfully. And of course, I took too much credit by suggesting I could follow in Jerry's footsteps because I haven't left enough time for even one audience question. <laughs> I'm operating on apparently Turkish time and not on the organizational principles and administrative prowess for which Laura is uh, so famous. Uh, but please join me in uh, thanking this extraordinary panel. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who are following along in the program, um, you might notice that sadly I am not Devin Carbato. Um, I am Jasleen Coley, the executive director of the Cocoa Race Studies Program. This past summer, we had an event, um, a panel on the recent affirmative action decisions, and at the last minute, Devin had called because he had an emergency and he had a very serious pickleball injury. And, um, you know, I, I made him promise me that he would not engage in any dangerous activities before this symposium, yet he came up with another excuse, um, which unfortunately was, is a, a conflict that's hard to um, be, beat, which is the birth of his first grandchild. So, um, and if you look at our program, you might notice this angry looking teenager in some of the pictures. Um, surprisingly, that angry teenager is now a grandfather. Um, so, um, so I have been given the task to, um, to say Devin's words. Luckily, he had written out his comments, which are beautiful and um, I wish I could take credit for, but these are his words. I am nowhere near as charismatic as Devin, but I attribute that at least 70% to his accent, um, which I will not try to mimic, although I had several helpful suggestions that I should try. Um, so again, good evening, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to see you all here. My name is Devin Carbato. It's not it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce a person who certainly needs no introduction, Laura Gomez, and to celebrate her remarkable achievements over the course of her career. Achievements that are, that are all the more extraordinary because they inspire us to strive for a more just and equitable world. Given who Laura is and all the outstanding things she has done, this is precisely one of those introductions in which I could yap on and on and on and on until the break of dawn to borrow from Erica Badu, but you didn't come here to hear from me or me as Devin or even this introduction. You came here to hear the woman herself, the star of the show as it were, and I am simply the warm-up act. And I want to begin this warm-up act by saying just a little bit, an itsy bitsy bit about Laura's scholarship notwithstanding that two panels have already spoken about the power of her work and of her words. In speaking about her scholarship against the backdrop of other people speaking about her scholarship, I am merely reproducing a particular and familiar logic of faculty governance norm. To wit, nothing is said until one says it. As some of you know, in the preface to Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, Robin Kelly writes, this book changed my life. Kelly then goes on to describe precisely what he meant by that. I am not going to say that Manifest Destiny has changed my life, again, Devin, um, though my life has changed and I have read Manifest Destinies. <laughs> but the fact that I am not saying Manifest Destinies changed my life might simply be because I am emotionally challenged. Again, Devin, not me. <laughs> as Laura herself never tires of telling me, again, Devin Carbato, not me. <laughs> but what I will say is that this book is, uh, sorry, 
is, in every possible way, a mark of brilliance. Um, brilliant as historical excavation. Brilliant, brilliant as doctrinal exegesis. Brilliant as normative analysis. And brilliant as critical theory. I turned to this book over again, not only to better understand the racialization of Mexican origin peoples, not only to learn the ways in which that racialization is rooted in colonization, not only to see the nexus between that colonization and indigenous genocide and dispossession on the one hand and the enslavement of people of African descent on the other, not only to grasp how all of this was bound up in a nation building project that naturalized and indeed constitutionalized white supremacy, Devin really has a way with words. Um, I turned to this book as well for its critical insights about the role of law. And indeed, one might say the rule of law throughout. Her, her book is perfect illustration of the role law plays, not only in mediating social relations, but also producing them. The book does all of this in the context of unraveling the intricate dynamics that shaped Mexican-American identity in the aftermath of the US-Mexico War. By challenging traditional narratives, introducing new ones, engaging with the complex interplay of law, sociology, and history, the, books, the book offers a nuanced understanding of racial and ethnic constructs and provides critical insights into broader questions of racial stratification in the United States. Moving from Manifest Destinies to Laura's scholarship more generally, I stand by my claim of brilliance. Laura's work bridges gaps between CRT and empirical methods, between black racial subordination and the subordination of other racial groups, between law and politics, between discurs discursive analysis and legal argumentation, between the past and the present, between power and knowledge, between scholarship and teaching, between academic and public discourse. Crucially, bridging the space between academic and public discourse has been particularly important amidst attacks on critical race theory and efforts to suppress voices advocating for racial justice. In the face of these challenges, Laura has remained steadfast in her commitment to advancing knowledge and challenging systemic inequities, including in, um, by engaging the public and including on, of all places, Dr. Phil, I remember that. Uh, who knew discussing critical race theory and more, specifically still white privilege, could lead to a daytime TV cameo? If nothing else, Laura's appearance in that domain is proof that she can hold her own in any conversation, even if it's with a talk show host who's often, though not always, more interested in drama than discourse. But I digress. The broader point is that Laura is simply, very simply, an outstanding scholar who are, whose work reminds us of the importance of looking to the bottom, both to name our existential realities and to imagine our articulate and realize our freedom dreams. Importantly, the mark Laura has made in legal academia is manifested not only in her scholarship, but also in her institutional leadership. Name that committee and she has served on it, and indeed chaired it. This is no small thing, particularly because managing academics can sometimes feel like herding not cattle, but cats. It's also no small thing that through Laura's administrative service, she has worked tirelessly in service of trying to make UCLA an inclusive and equitable learning environment, a project that is always a work in progress. At any rate, I'm not going to articulate the broad scope of Laura's administrative service, which by the way, includes a ton of outside of the law school governance roles as well. One of the most significant pieces of which includes serving as president of the Law and Society Association, and she was the youngest person to hold that post. Except to say that she served as vice dean here at the law, at law school, chaired our internal and external appointments committees. In fact, Laura chaired the internal appointment, appointment committee that granted me tenure. Again, Devin, not me. Did I say that Laura was brilliant? Again, Devin's comment about. <laughs> so. More seriously, my, uh, my surmise is that we're one to ask Laura about the kind of service at the law school for which she is especially proud she might invoke the CRS program. She would say the crucial role she played helping to establish the CRS program, not only was she a profoundly important person in envisioning the program, she has been profoundly important in leading the program. She is both a founding faculty member of CRS and a founding co-director with Jerry Kong. 
I want to end by saying a few words about Laura's commitment to teaching, the kind of concern she evidences for students, the ways in which she centers student lives as an everyday dimension of her institutional life deserves enormous praise. This often invisible work, the countless hours spent guiding, encouraging, and challenging students is an important part of our enduring legacy. Don't take my word for it. Let's hear from the students in their own voice, or at least my voice as their voice, or my voice as Devin's voice as the student's voice. Um, so. Professor Gomez is the kind of professor you only dream about and hope to have. A master of her craft, a scholar of unmatched caliber, and a wonderful mentor to all students. This comment is in all caps. Professor Gomez is the best, please don't retire. Uh, we've all made that comment. <laughs> Another comment. Professor Go uh, Gomez is clearly invested in her students and pushed us to believe we were up to the challenge of engaging with complicated scholarship. It was also fun to get to see her a bit more pointed and strong in her critiques when interacting with our speakers than she usually is when interacting with students. I will add that, and again, that's Devin. It's always fun to see Laura be a bit more pointed, except perhaps when she is being a bit more pointed with oneself, which I will agree with Devin. <laughs> Another student comment reads, this is an ex excellent course and showcases all of Professor Gomez's greatest strengths. Care for students, care for faculty of color, care for the advancement of CRT scholarship. And still another, she is a fantastic professor and human being. To which I simply want to ask, can I get an amen? Yeah. A different student observed that Professor Gare Gomez cares, in caps, so much. Another student still, this course kept my fire burning. A different student remarked, love this course, loved it. And another, Professor G is an intellectual of the highest caliber. She is a true genius and a wonderful lecturer. And this comment is again in all caps. Favorite course at UCLA, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And then this one, she knows a lot of historical facts. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Two more comments and then I will stop. So this comment says, I have now come here and tried to submit my course evaluation for Professor Gomez's amazing course twice now. And both times my browser has timed out and all my gushing completely erased. I think because I just keep going on and on and on about how great she was this semester. I'm not going to write it out again, but I'm serious. I was really gassing her up, saying Evie Award caliber stuff, I'm serious. And she 100% deserves it. This semester was great, and she gives great writing feedback and fosters great discussion. Okay, got to make sure this doesn't time out again. Take this class. And finally, Professor Gomez is the only professor who has ever personally cared about me. In eight years of college, she is the only one who has reached out to me and checked on me personally, especially during a pandemic, to check and see if I was okay. On the last class, she recognized every student's personal struggle and welcomed us to explain how the pandemic has been harming us personally and academically. She listened intently and thoughtfully and recognized our stories and personal truths. She encouraged us to sit with and understand our brilliance and humanity. There's not a better person I would have wanted to take a class from. Gomez has a way of understanding who we are as people. She made me feel seen. And um, I didn't want to actually give remarks during the symposium because I was worried I'd get emotional. But as someone who um, also worked very closely with Laura during the pandemic, a difficult time as a new mother, um, worried about elderly low-income parents, and um, you know this little pandemic. I I completely resonate with these words about the way Laura has a way of understanding who we are as people and making us feel seen. So, um, God damn it, Devin, I didn't want to cry. So. Um, Quite clearly, Laura has touched the hearts and minds and souls of our students, and she has touched the hearts and minds and souls of all of us as well. As many of you already know, Laura is only kind of retiring, meaning she's trading one academic job for, wait for it, another academic job. <laughs> Perhaps she realized that retirement without tenure just isn't her style. Perhaps her thinking is that with respect to tenure, to death do us part. 
perhaps she's just looking forward to having a new excuse for more faculty meetings and the opportunity to chair yet another committee, curricular reform perhaps, is I think there's a story maybe there. I, the point is that as Laura embarks on this exciting new chapter, we're reminded of the timeless wisdom of Dr. Seuss. Devin's going to be a great grandpa. Um, you're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. But don't go too far. I hope you know how much you have mattered to me, that was Devin and me, as a colleague and a friend and a, friend and a mentor, again, Devin and me, and I think so many of us here. And I hope you know how much you have mattered to this law school as a scholar, a teacher, and an institutional leader. We are here as a community because you were, which is to say you, who you are is indelibly inscribed in the institutional life of the law school. Please join me in lifting the metaphorical glass as we express our deepest gratitude and extend our utmost congratulations to Laura Gomez. <laughs> Thank you, Devin <laughs> and Jasleen. Um, more than any other single individual, Devin is most responsible for my return to UCLA in 2011. As vice dean, he harassed me about coming back for a one-year visit, uh, which turned into a 13-year stay. Um, and I, I'm very grateful um, to that old grandpa. Uh, my heartfelt thanks uh, to those who have worked behind the scenes to bring us together, um, uh, and especially to Ida, and uh, I don't know if she's in here, she's probably outside doing work, um, and to Jesseline uh, Coley, um, who is the lifeblood of critical race studies at UCLA. Um, I want to thank all of you, and it's the first time I've actually gotten to see everybody <laughs> all at once, quite amazing. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, some students that I've had as students recently, some students that I've had as students a long time ago, not only Saul, but, but also in, I mean, the whole range of this 30-year period. Um, I really, you know, am, am proud of all of you. And to my colleagues, there are some of my uh, Latino faculty colleagues from other schools here, which is total, you know, which is wonderful, pleasant uh, surprise and gift. To my wonderful um, uh, colleagues at UCLA on the staff of, of uh, the law school and faculty colleagues um, who, who spoke today, my friends in other departments and uh, units of UCLA who are here, um, uh, to the uh, friends of mine from earlier eras of my life. I have three friends from law school who are here. Um, I have uh, some college friends who are here. Um, I uh, have been very, very lucky in the, in the friend uh, department. Uh, so uh, I want to I thank one particular um, person in the audience um, who is my mother. Um, Eloida Gonzalez Gomez. I know she looks like my sister. Um, my mom and her identical twin were born at home um, in 1940s Roswell, New Mexico. Um, and she and her sister. Um, were sent to a segregated school, um, ironically called La Escuelita Blanca, 
um, because of, of their assumed uh, lack of English language proficiency. And this was, as we know from many other places in the United States as well, a tried and true way of dampening the um, educational achievement and potential of Mexican-American students. She became the first in her family to graduate from high school, um, and I came along uh, about a year later. When my brother and I were in elementary school, she worked part-time while earning an associate's degree and becoming a licensed registered nurse um, when I was in middle school. Um, she quickly found her niche on the cancer ward of Albuquerque's largest hospital, um, where she became the first board-certified oncology nurse in the state of New Mexico. Mom, thank you for your example of ambition and perseverance, for speaking up for those who couldn't speak for themselves, and thank you for being an extraordinary mother and, and grandmother. So what might I say that is meaningful on this day, the Ides of March? Might I be inspired by the 2011 film, The Ides of March, featuring Ryan Gosling <laughs> and George Clooney, a political thriller uh, about a presidential candidate which is too, too similar to today? Or the 1948 novel by the same name by Thornton Wilder, which Wilder himself described not fully positively as a kind of crossword puzzle. I've never been very good at crossword puzzles, although I played a sitting up dead person in Wilder's play Our Town in high school. <laughs> Historically, the Romans celebrated the Ides of March. Spring was on the horizon and they sacrificed animals to the, the god Jupiter, um, giving rise to the term scapegoat. Um, the sacrifice would be followed by feasting and drinking and revelry among the peasantry, something that maybe we will do in a few minutes. <laughs> Probably the best known reference to the Ides of March comes from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, of course. And in the play, a soothsayer, uh, warned Caesar on the day of his assassination, beware the Ides of March. Men are sometimes, men sometimes are masters of their fates, but in ourselves that we are underlings. And rather than think of these lines as being about a friend's betrayal, let's instead understand them as, as centering the danger of thinking we control much of anything in our lives. To be sure, we make some choices, and those choices sometimes open up or close off this or that pathway. But there is fortuity in paths crossing and events leading us in directions we had not anticipated. Consider how critical race studies first came about. It was 24 years ago, almost exactly, when a group of us met to talk. We were frustrated by the first two years of the truly dismal results of the law school's implementation of Proposition 209's ban on affirmative action. Students were likewise frustrated, having led a massive protest the month before we met. And I had called us together, newly emboldened by my recent uh, positive vote uh, of tenure on the faculty, which was due partly to my work, but partly to um, many allies on the faculty, some of whom are here today. Um, uh, behind the scenes work that is often the kind of work that we don't, uh, we don't realize how much a part of our, of our academic lives that work is. Um, so uh, we had asked two questions in that meeting. Uh, what courses related to race, racism, and the law were we planning to teach next year, the following year? And what could we do about Proposition 209? And quite organically, our conversation that day turned to a different question, one that none of us had premeditated. 
could we assemble those courses, classes most of us were already teaching, into a coherent program of study? Such an initiative could accomplish four things. It could attract a more diverse student body. It could signal our collective action at a moment when we felt powerless. It could train students to become civil rights attorneys and even law professors. And it could create a kind of intellectual community to keep us, to keep us charged here. After an intense behind the scenes organizing and contentious, after intense behind the scenes organizing and a contentious faculty meeting, some of you were in attendance at, CRS was approved as the law school's first concentration that spring, and today it is firmly institutionalized. My remarks today come in the form of three flash flashbacks from my life, three acts of a play, so to speak, that illuminate a larger principle. Why we cannot turn away from fighting for a legal academy that looks more like the population we serve. These three moments in time reveal the ways in which I was repeatedly the first and the only and why I have fought to make sure that I am not the last. This personal narrat narrative builds on the modality of storytelling in critical race theory, evident in the acclaimed work of several of my CRS colleagues, including Cheryl Harris in Whiteness as Property. In 2012, my teacher, mentor, and friend, Charles R. Lawrence, was asked to be a respondent to my Law and Society Association presidential address, which was published in the Law and Society Review. And I opened that talk with a story about my father, and one of Chuck's requests was that I tell even more stories. He wrote, Our stories construct race and constitute community. We give meaning to the text of law and social science, and we understand these texts and ourselves in the same way that we understand race, through the stories we tell. We must know that the work of social scientists and lawyers participates in the construction of race. We must choose sides in this battle and flood the world with our stories. Our stories are all that we have. His own biographical narrative shaped critical race theory's commitment to the transformative power of narrative. See Lawrence's landmark 1987 article, The Id, the Ego, and Equal Protection. Of course, the first generation of critical race theory scholars drew on the fact that judges and lawyers are storytellers at their core. Whether it is judges, some of whom my former students are here, whether it is judges uh, writing, crafting their judicial opinions, or how litigators engage in what we might call competitive storytelling. So my story today will unfold in three acts. Act one, a flashback to my father, a beneficiary of and a warrior for affirmative action. Act two, a flashback to my high school, college, and Stanford educations, my experience as an affirmative action baby. Act three, a final flashback, getting my foot in the door at UCLA and what underrepresented scholars and teachers bring to the table. So the first flashback goes back to 1941 in Roswell, New Mexico again. My father, Antonio Carillo Gomez, was born in a two-room house shared by his parents and six older siblings, a house that didn't have indoor plumbing until he was in high school. He was the only one to graduate from high school. And not long after being drafted into the Army and stationed in the Panama Canal Zone, he returned to Roswell, and I came along soon after that. Even at that young age and without role models in his family, he was driven becoming a delegate to the New Mexico State Democratic Convention in 1964, the year I was born, and taking college courses at the Roswell branch of Eastern New Mexico University. 
we make a joke about that in our family. It was the Roswell branch. <laughs> Just before I turned two, our, our family of four moved 200, 240 miles north and a world away to Albuquerque. There, my dad worked full-time to support his young family, was a full-time student at the University of New Mexico, and became a civil rights activist. This was 1966 to 1969, and the new Chicano civil rights movement was just emerging. My father led the formation of the United Mexican American Students Association at the university. They had an agenda that ranged from improving the wages of the, the Chicano workers who were overwhelmingly in the lowest rungs of labor at the university to uh, decreasing the discrimination against black and Chicano students at the university. Dad graduated in three years and was admitted to the nation's top PhD program in sociology at Berkeley. And in 1969, the four of us drove to California in a tan Volkswagen Bug my brother was tiny enough to stand on the hump in the back seat, and all of our belongings fit in that little car. Dad was part of the first cohort of affirmative action admittees to the sociology department. A handful of Chicanos, including two from New Mexico, and African American men. He worked closely with Robert Blauner, whose theory of internal colonialism remains influential today. And though my father left Berkeley ABD, all but dissertation, he is among the most truly intellectual persons I have ever known. We returned to Albuquerque, and for 24 years, my father was an administrator at the University of New Mexico. For the first several years, he ran the first affirmative action program of the new medical school, which had just opened in 1969 and whose inaugural dean was the father of former UC president Janet Napolitano. Later, Dad directed a variety of fellowship programs that enabled hundreds, maybe thousands, of Chicano, Native American, and African American students to obtain PhDs, MDs, and JDs at New Mexico's flagship campus. This first act is crucial to my own development because I'm proudly a twofold beneficiary of affirmative action across two generations. The second flashback considers my own educational experiences at Valley High School, Harvard College, and Stanford University. What I want to say about Valley High School, where I had many successes, including as the National Forensic League debate champion, as student body president, is that it was an incredibly racist place a microcosm of the racist society in which it, of which it was a part in the late 1970s and early 1980s. One of the techniques of racial oppression was tracking, meaning that my honors English and honors math classes had few Mexican American students and zero Native American students, despite the fact that the school's white population was dwarfed by them in about an eight to one ratio. 8 to 2 ratio. Features like tracking created a hierarchy in which white kids were empowered. Even kids from working class white families and even kids whose parents were European immigrants. Simultaneously, tracking and the systems that supported it created a feeling of inferiority among students of color even among those of us who were successful in traditional ways. And we haven't studied enough how similar racial projects advantage whites today, such that racial privilege isn't just something that was produced in the distant past. Certainly, I was more insulated than my working class Chicano peers because of the cultural capital my dad's education and career gave us. I was constantly reading books, newspapers, magazines, and our family debated the issues of the day at the dinner table. Yet my parents, having no intergenerational wealth and substantial student loan debt, couldn't afford to purchase a home until I was in middle school. When I went to Harvard in 1982, I became the first Latina 
or Latino admitted to the exclusive social studies major. I was the first Mexican-American editor of the Harvard Crimson. I was the first Hispanic Truman scholar in the country. I was very cognizant of the fact that my admission to Harvard and other opportunities were in no small part due to affirmative action. But I never once felt stigmatized or ashamed by that. Instead, I realized how much easier my economically privileged classmates, my classmates who had attended private schools or well-regarded public schools, how much better they were prepared for Harvard, how much easier college was for them. During my years at Harvard, there were around 30 Puerto Rican students a year and about 30 Mexican-American students a year, although smallers of them, smaller numbers of them were involved in our activities, some of them social, many of them social, some of them academic, some of them political, including our demands for Latino faculty, for courses about Latinos, and for a dean of diversity. We also encouraged, and we failed in all of those. We also engaged in a lot of activities with Asian American and African American students whose numbers probably weren't much more than ours. I recall only one Native American student at Harvard, and I was talking recently to a Native American friend who overlapped with me, and he said there were there were fewer than five Native Americans a year at Harvard during their, those years out of a class, an annual class of 1,200. During my four years there and for decades afterwards, there wasn't a single U.S.-born Latino faculty member across all the units of the university. And this meant that there were no courses on the Latino experience at Harvard. And so I gravitated to Harvard's new African American Studies program. And I took all of the courses in the social sciences and history in that program. And I would always write uh, a, a final paper comparing Chicanos and African Americans, not knowing this would be my, my life's work for so many uh, years to come. Uh, one of the things that was most attractive to me about Stanford, uh, and one of my graduate school friends is here as well, um, was that there were actually living Chicano professors on the faculty, uh, one of whom is in this room. Um, uh, and uh, this included two tenured professors at the law school, the late Miguel Mendez, a Tejano, and East LA native Jerry Lopez both of whom were my teachers, my mentors, and lifelong friends. When I finished my PhD in 1994, I became the first Mexican-American woman in the country to have obtained a JD and a PhD in any field. And the first Puerto Rican woman to do so was my teacher, mentor, and uh, friend Blanca Silvestrine, um, who was a visiting professor during my years at Stanford Law School. Stanford Law School and Stanford University themselves benefited immensely from affirmative action. They drew on an exceptionally strong pool of young people of color who in the 1980s dramatically increased the number of people of color in elite university graduate and professional programs. My third flashback is thinking about affirmative action at UCLA regarding student admissions and faculty hiring, including my own experience. I was hired in 1993 as the first Latina and the second woman of color on the tenure track faculty. In 1992, when I was clerking, before, but before I had, had written my dissertation, I decided to test the law school teaching market. I, di I, I didn't apply via the formal process managed by the American Association of Law Schools, and instead I sent my cover letter and my CV to the dean of a dozen law schools. That was unusual at the time, but non-traditional hiring had been the norm in elite law school hiring um, for a long time um, previously. And I knew at least two white law professors at Stanford, young men 
during my time there, who were hired in the early 1980s, who were hired in the following way. Their mentor at a fancy law school on the East Coast called up the dean of Stanford Law School and said, there's this great kid, you ought to hire him. Kid then went to have lunch with the dean and a few faculty members, and voila, was hired as an assistant professor. So much for meritocracy. And yet nobody assumed that they were the undeserved beneficiaries of affirmative action. Every law school I wrote eventually invited me for preliminary interviews with the hiring committee and then to a full faculty interview. I have no doubt that affirmative action played a role in that. At all but two, I would have been their first Latina assistant professor and at most the first Latinx professor of any gender. And in fact, in 1982, a year before, there were only 22 US-born Latino tenure-track law professors in the entire country, excluding the University of Puerto Rico. By 1993, when I was hired by UCLA, and that was the only job offer I received, um, when I was hired by UCLA, that number had climbed more than fourfold to 94, and it included 33 Latinas, 51 Mexican Americans, 17 Puerto Ricans, 17 Cuban Americans, and nine other Hispanics. We, I say that, that's how they were designated by the American Association of Law Schools. When I started teaching, Latinos were 2% of tenure track law professors in the nation. And in that year, I became the third Latino on the UCLA faculty. The late Cruz Reynoso and the late Robert Garcia were here already. Robert, who had attended Stanford Law School as well, and who was Guatemalan American, left a year later, having been told his prospects for tenure were bleak. Jerry Lopez returned to UCLA a few years later um, leaving behind an endowed chair at Stanford. But not long after I received tenure in 2000, Cruz left to UC Davis and Jerry left to NYU, making me the only Latino man or woman on the tenure track faculty. UCLA didn't hire another US born Latinx tenure track faculty member until Rachel Moran became dean in 2010. UCLA rehired me in 2011. So to sum up, between 1993 and 2019, the UCLA law faculty voted to hire, or actually hired, succeeded in hiring, I can't speak to the votes as I wasn't on the faculty all of that time, succeeded in hiring um, only one US born Latinx person, uh, Rachel Moran, which technically she was hired by the executive vice chancellor. For a period of two miraculous years, there were three Mexican-American women on this faculty. In addition to Rachel and myself, Jennifer Chacon joined us from 2019 to 2021, leaving to Berkeley and then Stanford Law School a year later. In 2020, when Rachel left to UC Irvine, I was once again the only Mexican-American and the only non-international Latino faculty member. Today, the number of Latinx law professors, professors nationally is 280. But since the number of law schools and the number of tenure track professors has increased over the course of that time, we are still only two to 3% of law professors. And this is the case despite the fact that Latinos are 9.4% of law students and 21% of the national population and 40% of the California population. UCLA Law's poor track record on faculty hiring stands in contrast with its relative successes admitting a diverse student body. For example, in 1967, the faculty started its first affirmative action program, and by 1969, there were 15 black and Chicano first-year law students at UCLA. 
Jump ahead to the first year I taught 1Ls, fall of 1994, so the class of 1997, Saul's class, and just over half of them were people of color. It was UCLA Law's most racially diverse class ever. But a year later, the UC Regents voted to curtail race-based admissions, and a year after that, California voters passed Proposition 209, a constitutional amendment that barred the consideration of race and gender in student admissions and hiring by public universities and other state entities. But via trial and error, and using a variety of different mechanisms, UCLA law has been able to maintain a significant proportion of Latino students. Not enough, but significant. For example, over the past five years, Latinx matriculation has ranged from 10 to 23 percent of the first year class, meaning 32 to 72 students out of classes ranging in size from 320 to 360. Although Mexican American students have been substantial, 14 to 25 a year out of those five years, and Puerto Rican and Cuban American students have been represented, 4 to 12 students a year in those five years. The Latinx students also include those designated by the Law School Admissions Council as other Hispanic, and I suspect that those are Central American students, 6 to 11 a year here in the last five years. But a larger group have self-identified as Latin American Latinos, 14 to 25 a year. Overall, most of the students, 209 of 255 over five years, have been California residents. Yet UCLA Law School hasn't come close to the numbers of Latinos in the California population, where we are 15, 6 point million people. Nationally, 65% of Latinos are Mexican American, and the number is higher in California, but that certainly isn't reflected in the numbers of students in the makeup of our Latinx student body. If the late Michael A. Olivas was still compiling his dirty dozen list, UCLA Law would be on it. His list, published for a decade starting in 1987, sought to shame law schools into hiring American-born Hispanic tenure-track professors, as Michael put it. He singled out schools where there was a substantial number of Latinx students enrolled, but um, uh, no Latino professors. And with my retirement, as you have heard today, UCLA Law will have zero US-born Latino faculty. It is devastating for me to say those words, to, to say that next year, UCLA will have fewer Latinx faculties than Stanford, Yale, and Harvard currently have, and fewer than Stanford Law School had in the 1980s when I was a student there. And the same two excuses Michael wrote about as justifications for the half of all law schools who have never, ever hired a Latinx faculty member remain prominent at UCLA. First, that the pool of qualified candidates is too small. And second, that other candidates are just better. UCLA law puts up its hands to say, what can we do given these realities. In a soon-to-be-published article, Latino law professor Stephen Bender and Ediberto Roman reach a gloomy conclusion for U.S.-born Latinos being hired given the Supreme Court's decision in 2023 in the SFAA versus Harvard case. That opinion, of course, ends affirmative action in student admissions, and they predict it will eventually end affirmative action in faculty hiring. I have a different prognosis, but only if schools, including UCLA, do what the California State University system has been doing successfully since Proposition 209. They hire and recruit faculty based on field of study 
and their likely strengths in mentoring a diverse student body. Imagine what it would look like to hire a law professor in Latinos and the law as a field, or to hire a, a faculty member who has a proven track record, record of excellent mentorship to Latinx students. In closing, I submit that affirmative action has been a success. It has produced scholars whose intellectual agenda is unique, is different from what had come before. The emergence of critical race theory as a field in the early 1990 is a great example. It isn't for me to say what the legacy of my intellectual work will be, but I can say that I have pursued two major themes. First, how do we more accurately map the American racial hierarchy to account for more than two racial groups and for how white supremacy fortifies both historically and in our lifetimes intergroup is fortified um, by intergroup dynamics across racial groups. And second, reading across law and the social sciences, how do we explain the racialization of Mexican Americans and Latinos generally across Spanish colonization, US imperialism in the Americas in the 20th and 21st centuries, and the United States today? And I'm thrilled to see scholars in a variety of disciplines carrying these questions forward. I'm grateful to have been part of this particular intellectual community, Critical Race Studies at UCLA, and I look forward to the law school proving its skeptics wrong. Thank you. that um, as I asked earlier if to raise a metaphorical glass this time um, I would like us to actually raise an actual glass outside um, and toast Laura so I hope you will join us um, at our reception which is in the courtyard and um, and thank you all for joining us <laughs>